Three, two, one. Boys and girls, ladies and gents, welcome to another episode of Steady Miguel. It's Uncle Silk. It's Dan. And Nick. Same corner, same time. How was y'all boys weekend? Good weekend. Good weekend. I mean, Go ahead, me, Nick. I, I get such a, uh, there's so many baseball games that when they start doing these Thursday, Friday, Saturdays, I lose track. Like Thursday, did the game, wake up Friday, could have swore it was Saturday. And then I wake up Sunday and I just got nothing to do. So I just got a nice little Sunday to myself. No, you didn't go see mom? Deal. Mom's five and a half hours away. So it's been five a Five and a time. half hours, Nick? Are you taking a bicycle down to right. Weston? So it's funny. So I, I get I can go <laughs> I can go door to door in like just under five. Um told the girlfriend that the first time uh, she was coming down to Thanksgiving with the family and because of her work at she works at the hospital because of her work we couldn't leave until the Wednesday before Thanksgiving at five mm. it took us eight and a half hours in traffic to get down that is she looks nuts and she looks at me and she goes five hours I'm like you've been sleeping half the time I don't want to talk about it but yeah no this is not five hours Jeez, that's a that's a long drive, man. I uh, I used to always try to beat my time when I was and obviously Coral Springs is a bit closer than Weston, but I always used to try to beat my time. I think I got down from from Gainesville to Coral Springs in about three hours and forty minutes one time. I was booking it. Probably that's cooking. Take, yeah, that was cooking. That was that yeah, that's was my the, youth. My youth, I used to try to like get record time. Now I just want to like make it there with no ticket and a lot. Yeah, yeah. Now, now I just vibe. I just put on a podcast yeah. and just kind of hang out, right? If it takes four hours, four hours, fifteen, that's all right. But yeah, I'll stop like two times on my way to Orlando. Like I'll stop for anything, stretch, you know. <laughs> just finding a reason to stop. <laughs> yeah, just to vibe real quick. It, it and is, and yeah. and like I get recognized a lot from the podcast at Red Stop, so you know, oh, like, oh, okay. like get my yeah, ego. So you sign some autographs stuff. and all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you're you're stopping at every single rest stop. On the way, just kind, of like po- just kind of like posting up, looking around, yeah. seeing like, hey, does anyone notice me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You guys see me I make sure I wear a big three roll up shirt or a yeah. Yeah. as well. Yeah. Silk's at the Port St. Lucie rest stop, just hanging out for like an hour <laughs> and a half. <laughs> Kara's like, can we go home? He's like, nah, just not vibing. yet, babe. <laughs> just vibing. Not, not until someone, not until someone asks if I'm Silk from Twitter. <laughs> Oh, Silk is famous at rest stops. I love it. Oh man, uh, I'm not sure about you boys, but I we had some fantastic weather this weekend. I was um, I got to play in a golf tournament on uh, on Friday. My team won, not a big deal. Uh, shot 59 uh, as a team, not as an individual, but uh, so we took home first place, uh, which was great. But other than that, went down to the Saturday morning market in St. Pete. We looked out for Berg, but he wasn't there. Um, other than that, just kind of vibed in St. Pete, uh, and then I went to this. I uh, went to this really cool speakeasy thing on uh, on Saturday night. Ebor City's doing these like pop ups that are like two weeks long. I think I told you a couple weeks ago I went to like a haunted one, uh, but this one was really cool. You felt like you were in a speakeasy. They acted like it. Uh, There's banging on the door, pretend cops, all that kind of fun stuff. So it was a it was a cool pretend vibe. Pretend cops. Like yeah. That time. yeah, yeah, bro. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure, it's, I'm sure it's different for me and you. You know, <laughs> a, like a terrible a, time, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a code of honor when you're in those when you're in those golf tournaments. Dan, Did anyone kind of you, you get any side eyes when you when you walk in and report that 59? Because it's only so, a two, it was a two man scramble, right? No, it was, it was a four man scramble. Okay. So 59. So we won by by two strokes. Uh, there's one team that shot a 61. There's a couple teams that shot a 63. Uh, I think the only people that get side eyes are the people that record scores uh, above a par because that's really hard to do with a with a four. It well, it depends on how many. Uh, Alcoholic beverages <laughs> you're consuming. Oh, uh, the beers right? were flowing, Nick. That you just call that swing oil, Dan. That's just swing oil. Hmm. I like that. Yeah, dude, it was, but it was perfect. How's the weather over by you guys? Pretty good. Yeah, it was pretty good down here. It was great, um, for the most part, I had um, my son had a scrimmage. He had his first football scrimmage Saturday, so um, I took him to practice, hung out. Then I did my last minute fourth quarter Mother's Day shopping. Got that out of the way. Dropped mom's gift off Saturday. And Sunday was just all relaxation, man. You know, um, wife did her thing, vibe. Man, I was just, I had the house to myself. They was out doing her doing things with her family. So I just crashed, man. Slept all day. Felt great. 
What's on, what's the – well, first off, has Harlem thrown a pass yet, or is he still just stealing ankles? Yeah, he ain't really passing the ball too much, man. Um, <laughs> He threw two incompletions and one interception during the scrimmage, Ooh. but – he rushed for about 5,000 yards. Yeah, how many ankles did he take, though? He was over <laughs> yeah. one, but, but, but we had to throw the ankles in the back of the truck on the way home. Yeah, um, he's shaking off, though. He used to get frustrated when he throw uh, interceptions, but now he's just, like, brushing it off, get to the next play. He laughed him off a little bit now. But, yeah, we're working on the passing game. They don't – They. I mean, it's flag, man. They're, they're flying in there fast, and first instincts is take off. So he just, he's, just, he's just being an athlete right now. I'm shocking they got him at quarterback. This is his first year playing flag football, so that this is just shocking. I think it's because you put the the ball in the athlete's hand. Right. You've had him in the sand pits for two years. He hasn't even got to Chad's (laughs) yet. Wait till he gets to Chad's house. Right. What's the difference between Father's Day and Mother's Day? What's the the different vibe? A love. People actually care and shit yeah. on Mother's Day, you know, love. People putting thought into it and all. Right. They just throw me a pair of socks and close the door. <laughs> but that's what you want, right? Nah. <laughs> I want nice stuff too, Dad. <laughs> I love it, man. Hey, shout out, shout out to all the moms out there. We, we should have started our show uh, by doing that. I wasn't able to see my mom this week. I'm going to see her in a couple of weeks uh, at the old family reunion. Um, but uh, but shout out to all the moms out there. Do y'all get t-shirts made for the family reunion? Like no, black people? No, there? Uh, no, no, sir. No, sir. No, our family reunions are very much, and I'm sure my, my family's not gonna love hearing this when they listen to the show, very much a, a get in, get out type of deal, you know? Yeah, just you know, go shake hands in, and shit. Yeah, go shake here. hands, kiss some babies, <laughs> and, and just kind of keep it moving, right? That's a wild family reunion. Yeah. You know, I, I get kind of jealous when I see people that have family reunions that have like hundreds of people at them and they're all wearing the same shirt and they're like these weekend, you know, yeah, long trips. Some people go on cruises and stuff. Ours is everybody gets there. It's supposed to start at 12. Most people get there like 1245. <laughs> everybody starts kind of looking at their watches around 115, 130 and everybody's out the door by two, you know. Hey, man, some of my family, I wish I could just meet with them like that. I'm going to be honest with you, man. Just real brief, quit at Carabas. You know, <laughs> I love it. Man. I don't even yeah. want to spend too much money. You know what I'm saying? Carabas, real quick, get up out of here. Yeah, not our, sponsor. Yeah, not a sponsor. Yeah, no sponsor. Carabas, if you're if, Mr. Caraba, if you're listening, no, ours is down in Sebring in a few weeks. I'll, I'll report back on the shenanigans that did or likely did not happen, though. Very good. Very good. Well, let's get let's get started on the show. We got two big guests today. We got uh, Tim Olson former Florida Gator legend baseball player, and then we got our man Connor Clark uh, coming on. But let's give a shout-out to our friend Lee Friedland at the law firm of Friedland & Associates. He's going to help you with auto accidents, medical malpractice, nursing home cases, criminal matters, and personal injury cases in every jurisdiction within the state of Florida. Give him a call at 1-800-95-INJURED or visit him at yourfighthourbattle.com. Again, 1-800-95-INJURED. Uh, injured or your fight our battle.com all right boys let's get in to the show um as always we will get started with the news that is going on in the world the biggest news that happened today was that former florida gator quarterback heisman trophy winner a former nfl quarterback former ma- or minor league baseball player i guess major league baseball player too Timothy Robert Tebow is likely going to be signing with the Jacksonville Jaguars at the ripe old age of 34 years old as a tight end. Silk, as a notable Jaguars fan, tell us your thoughts. Come again and say what? As a notable Jaguars fan, tell us your thoughts about Timothy Tebow being signed to your team. Come again and say what? No, I'm just playing. Um... (laughs) Yeah, I don't know what I don't know what Tim got going on or Urban got going on. It's just random and weird. Um, most of Tim's friends are retiring, um, teammates, old teammates, classmates. I think this football game is very violent. I think that this older age, I don't think it's smart to come start playing uh, the position of tight end and catching slants from a rookie quarterback. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know how it makes a lot of sense. This is weird. Yeah, I was trying. To, I was trying to think besides. Joe Hayden, who played with Tim Tebow 
That's Jenkins. still in the NFL. He's just retired. Uh, yep. Jenkins did. Did Jonathan – Jonathan Harrison might have had some overlap. No, I don't think so. No? Maybe he maybe during his retro year for him. I, I guess John Bostic maybe. Did they have some overlap or was Bostic mm -hmm. a three-year guy or four-year guy? Yeah, four -year Carlos guy. Dunlap. Oh, Carlos Dunlap, yeah. Yeah, Dunlap for sure. Marcus Gilbert. I, I think Jalapeno retired. retired, right? Yeah, Gilbert retired. No, Jalapeno was – I think he just got signed like towards the end of the year. Yeah. His story is crazy. I can, yeah, but we, I'll, I, can, I, need, I can get him on. We need to get him on to talk about his story because he went undrafted, cut. He was selling cars, um, waking up you know, at 4 a.m. to go run and lift and do all that and then going and selling cars and, and then you know got a shot with the Giants. Um, but I think he's still trying to get back in the league. He'd be a good one to talk to. Who, Gilbert or Jalapio? Jalapio. That was Jalapio. Gilbert oh, okay. got drafted and okay. spent 10 years in Pittsburgh. Yeah, that's that's right. I, my apologies. Nonetheless, um, <laughs> yeah, I, think, I just think it's like <laughs> it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I think this is the move I thought he should have did when, instead of playing baseball, right? Uh, to come play football now after trying baseball this late in, late, late in age. I don't get why it makes sense. And um, Jaguars don't need to sell tickets. They got the, the they got the guy. They got trouble. They got tickets. Because yeah. <laughs> I remember that when when in back in 2010, uh, then Governor Charlie Chris had a quote saying like, the Jaguars should draft Tim Tebow just because they would sell tickets, and and they haven't been selling tickets because they were. What do you bad. guys think about it? <clears throat> I think you got to tread lightly whenever you're talking about Tim Tebow. Right, because uh, because of his stature with Gator fans, and so what? Um, you have an opinion? Yeah. Like, get you, what do you, what do you think? I gave my opinion. He went to go play baseball, scared. and I and I and I learned I learned me real good about uh, saying negative things about Tim Tebow. I ain't saying nothing negative. Just say what do you think about him coming to play I football think, this I late I think it's weird trying to restart a career in a new position when you're 34. Um, but it makes sense. Like, listen, Urban's Urban's trying to get the band back together. He might, uh, he might see <laughs> Urban lost his damn mind. Man. He might see if Marcus Gilbert wants to play right tackle in Jacksonville. <laughs> maybe he's just retired, but like, hey, he's get the whole. Maybe Dan can be offensive coordinator. Okay, so if Tebow makes this roster, do you do you foresee uh, him pulling Trevor off on maybe a third or fourth and one and letting Tebow run it, uh, yeah. crash dummy style? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You gotta make the team the, first. The, the, it's wild. He's not I gonna cut know. him. You think Urban's gonna I cut Tebow? I can't yes. imagine a world. I can't imagine no. a I can, world. I can see Tim Tebow gracefully like retiring, right, with his old coach, right. <laughs> hey, the, the I mean, man, you froze like. Man, Dan, Dan still I mean, got that boo. -boo have we, it. bar not the fact that he's like changing position. Oh shit. <laughs> um, is it, it to me? Yeah, to me, like I, I get why he didn't want to change it in the first place. He's like, hey, I'm going to be a quarterback. I loved his quote um, when he was coming up in the draft in 2010. He's like, I don't need all 32 teams to like me. I just need to find one that does. It just sucks that he found the the guy in Josh McDaniel, and then Josh McDaniel gets fired <laughs> one year into it. Um, so to me, he's got a coach that believes in him, a coach that'll give him every opportunity, and uh, we'll we'll see. But I mean, like the NFL just keeps getting younger and younger. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you're you're at a point where like 32 is old, and now right. you're 34 trying to learn a new position, and you're going to have a team that I'm assuming is going to start a rookie quarterback from day one. Um, and everybody just wants to tee off on Tebow. That's why I don't, I don't like him. Playing well, tight just, end. People just you know? hate on him. People just hate on him too. And like, listen, I, I was like, I don't get why he's going to play baseball. When he, when he first went to play baseball, I was like, you haven't played since 2005. A lot of people were like, he's stealing mm -hmm. somebody's roster spot. Somebody who's played baseball and is playing. Like, listen, if Tim Tebow's stealing your roster spot, you weren't going to make it anyway, buddy. <laughs> Go find something else to do. Um, but he he played he other than like eleven I don't even know how you have eleven errors in in the outfield that's <laughs> you're actively trying to make errors if you have that many in the outfield other than that like in his went, career or in no, one no that season? was in his first season oh wow that's that's a lot yeah 
Yeah, lot. that's that was his first. It's it's hard to make errors in left field. Uh, he made it look easy at times, but he he hit for power. He hit for you know I think he hit like two twenty two, but he had some decent power numbers and uh, and he he brought a lot of people to the seats in in for the St. Lucie Mets. <laughs> um, so it, it'll be interesting to me. I, I I don't know how Urban cuts him. I can't imagine that conversation. Yeah, I wasn't mad that he played baseball, man. Like, as long as what we, if he was happy, who, who, I didn't care. You know what I'm saying? Like, I want him to go play tight end if he don't want to play tight end. The quarterback thing ain't work. He want to play baseball. Cool. But now, like, it just, I don't know. It's just kind of weird. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how he succeeds in this role. I don't know what kind of prep work he's been putting in. You know, seven years out of professional football is a long time, never playing the position before. Hell, I'll give him all the credit in the world if he makes that roster. I just I, – I don't see how that's – He's not going to cut him, Dan. Well, I'm saying that's why I still think that Tebow will probably work out and then decide, hey, like maybe this isn't for me and retire with his old coach. Who knows? But No, nah, he's going to run that dive. He about to run that power. But it's just wild to me. This guy gets like, Silk and, of Jags Tebow jersey. No, I'm cool, I mean, he's an bro. H-back? I, I'm, I'm going have it for like a year. No, I'm cool. What 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 number is he going to be? He can't be number fifteen. You can. He can't be fifteen. Oh, now he can, right? Is Gardner Minshew? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not buying any new Jags sir. I got I got a Hendo joint, but that was a gift. Hmm. I'm not really buying any Jag jerseys these days right now. I got to see what they I do first. You. I don't blame you. Well, Tim Tebow already lives in Jacksonville too, doesn't he? So, you know, it's made, it makes perfect sense for him. You got to give them something that folks in Jacksonville. You think the media circus is pulling up? I think the media circus already is there. That's the problem with Tim is like, listen, once he left, once McDaniels got caught cut and then he gets sent to New York. And then really when he got, when he got sent to New England, I thought, okay, good spot for him. He can sit there and he's, there's no pressure of starting, but the media circus follows him. And all of a sudden Bill Belichick, you know, and, and OTA is getting questions about at that point his third string quarterback. He's like, "What the hell is happening?" So, like, of no fault of Tim's own, the media circus follows him everywhere he goes. And then you got coaches not wanting to answer questions about the third quarterback on their depth chart. But that's always going to happen. So, like, Ur- I'm sure Urban's more than happy to talk Tim Tebow all day long. So I don't see that being an issue. Um, but yeah, the media circus follows Tim Tebow no matter where he goes. Hmm. I don't know. We'll see. All right. I mean, if anything, you know, Tim gets to earn a few bucks, but cause what? Cause he'd be a vet minimum. I think the vet minimum is like a million dollars. So yeah I'm, bad to get see. It. yeah. I'm interested to see. I just don't get the move. I'm damn sure going to watch. It's my team. I, don't, I don't get, I don't get Tim. it for Urban Meyer. Urban. I mean, for Tim Tebow, right? Like, I mean, you get paid, you get an opportunity, you get endorsements. I don't know. You just, for him, you get a workout with a world class strength and conditioning coach too. So, and we don't I, like our tight end depth chart is is in shambles as well. So that's why I was like, I don't see how he gets cut. I think he makes his roster. Well, yeah, keep chasing your dreams. That's the story here. He chased the baseball dream as far as he you know was going to take it. Uh, it. wasn't able to play in twenty twenty because there wasn't even a, a ML, uh, minor league baseball season. Um, now you got you've, you've had two dreams of playing in the NFL, playing Major League Baseball. You got another chance to uh, to chase one of those dreams. So more power to you. Mm. Well, I am here to see it. Speaking of the Jacksonville Jaguars, Corey, your friend C.J. Henderson has announced that he is going to be donating two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to Columbus High School to help build their athletic training facility and is going to be called the Henderson family athletic training center. So shout out to CJ Henderson and to the Henderson family there. Um, in other news, Florida soccer and lacrosse program um, have announced that they are going to be building a $7.4 million expansion of the team building at the Donald R Disney stadium. So uh, the renderings look incredible. It looks like it's going to be a great facility uh, for UF uh, women's soccer and women's lacrosse to use. That stadium was built, I believe, in 2009, 2010, uh, so getting a, uh, a much-needed expansion uh, and beautification. So it should look beautiful there right next to the uh, baseball stadium that was just built. Yeah, they're already breaking ground on that because they, uh, they took some parking spots. I got to uh, one of the Vandy games when it was busy, and I was like, oh, I'll just go park over. Ooh, ooh, 
Can't park there anymore. Hmm. Hmm. Well, shout out to them. Uh, let's get, uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts uh, here, Silk and, uh, and Nick. Uh, from Pro Football Focus, Mike Renner has announced his very early 2022 mock draft. Uh, we've seen the names Kyrie Elam before. He has Kyrie Elam going number eight. We've seen the name Brenton Cox potentially in the first round. He has him going number 32. But the name that is shocking everybody, Emory Jones, number six overall to the Philadelphia Eagles. Silk, Nick, your thoughts. Do you think Emory Jones can go number six, six overall? overall? Listen, bro, if Emory Jones is going six overall, Florida's – Florida's winning the SEC championship, playing for like a a college football championship. That's the first thought that I have when I saw that is like, damn, they think Florida's going to have a really, really good season. I can see a scenario scenario where Emory Jones comes back after this year. So like when I see six right now, I'm like, yeah, this is – we're getting a little preposterous in how early we're doing our mock drafts and what we're putting there. I think he's going to have a little uh, – I don't know, man. I think his offense could be explosive. I think they're probably counting on Dan getting back in his uh, run-heavy bag and, and getting back to some play-action stuff. And if our play-action, our run game could get going, we got some explosive guys like Cope and Hendo that could take the top off. And he got an arm strength to take the top off. Um, but six overall sounds absolutely nuts right now in my mind. Let me ask you guys a hypothetical. Do you think there's a greater chance that Emory Jones comes back – for his senior season or that he goes drafted in the first two rounds of the NFL draft next season? I would say first three rounds. I would say there's a better chance that he goes in the first three rounds. If you're, <laughs> I, I was, I was ready to pull the trigger quick. If you're going to say better chance, he goes at six. Oh no. I was, yeah. <laughs> I was ready to pull the trigger quick. I know he's coming back. Um, but first three rounds, like you, you see how many quarterbacks, Right, get drafted um, in, in the first three rounds. I mean, there's there's just like I said, two types of teams in, in the NFL: teams with a franchise quarterback and teams looking for one. And everyone's mm-hmm. you know looking for that next quarterback. And, and like Silk said, I think I'm expecting Dan to get more back into that run bag. And and Emory is not just a runner, but an electric kind of runner, right? an elusive runner with the ball in his hands, but like Silk said, too, has that arm strength where he, he can take the top off the defense. And I think that really plays in where if you're running, 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 the defense starts to sink in, take the top off really easy on a 50-yard touchdown pass real quick, and, and then, you know, then how do you defend him? Yeah, I think our offense can be uh, really good this year, but it's going to be pretty much on our, our offensive line getting the run game going. If they get that going, we can go. If they don't, we're going to have some problems. Yeah, I, um, I'm i curious to see how he does. Obviously, we've not seen Emory Jones run the full offense. He's not really been given the opportunity to do so. We saw him briefly against Auburn, and he looked pretty good doing it. So, you know, Emory Jones would have to have a hell of a season. Nick, I think that you said it. He would either have to have some monster individual numbers or, or this Gator team is at least – in the SEC championship, if not in the playoff for Emory Jones to go that man, far. Man, they about to cater this offense for Emory, and it's about to get cooking, man. It ain't gonna be what with Kyle ran. You know, like no. that's what Dan specializes in, man. Like catering the offense around what you really good at. And that's if why he, if like he can... catered the offense around Emory's skill set, like he could have an, a, a really good year. People getting caught up into like message board spring stuff. When you gotta put players through hell and and and, and fire you during the spring, you gotta throw stuff at them. That, that you know they can't handle to, to build them up. But when it's time to move the ball and and, and, and go score points, like dang them, cater the offense around Emory and it's gonna move with some click. Yeah, that's like let's let's just say there might be even more than this, but let's say Dan Mullen's got a thousand plays in his offensive plays in his playbook. In the spring, you're gonna throw a thousand different plays at guys just to figure out, hey, right. this we look terrible running this take it out we're not going to run that in the fall hey this looks good we need some more work on it keep that in we're going to work on it you know in the summer when we get back so the spring's just a learning time so you get on the message board and lambert jones sucks and he can't do this he can't do that so yeah man they're trying to figure out what he can and can't do so that you're not trying to figure it out um you know in september yeah that's that's the time you figure it out in the spring when you're just playing against yourself and you've got time to you know to figure out how 
how do we get the most out of not just Emory Jones, but how do we get the most out of all of the guys on offense and all the guys on defense? Right. But uh, to your question, Dan, I think it's more likely that he'd be gone um, to the draft than, than come back. Yeah, no, I would, I would, uh, I, I open, open, you know, I'm still open season on that. I, I have a feeling that there's a, a likelier chance that he goes into the NFL draft um, than he does to come back, but I don't know if he goes in the first three rounds. Uh, but I think that the Gators are excited about Anthony Richardson the season after, but we'll see. Um, I'm here for it. I'm excited for Anthony Richardson. I think, um, I remember. Um, not to compare the two, but I remember um, being like not super high on Justin Fields because I didn't think he was playing against great competition. And then he showed up at Friday Night Lights, and I just remember looking at him being like, oh, this kid is huge. Bro, yeah. this, <laughs> this kid is huge. I'm like, oh, maybe I thought he was playing against little kids <laughs> up there in Georgia because he's a grown-ass man. And he's playing against normal high school players, and he shouldn't be doing that. Um, so he, he changed my mind there. And I remember having that same same kind of uh, awakening when I saw Anthony Richardson. I'm like, this kid is big. And then you see the picture of him with, you know, standing next to Tim Tebow working out before his freshman year. And you're like, oh, he makes – he's not, like, as, as, as thick as Tim, like, as muscular as Tim, but he's taller than Tim. And I'm like, this is, this is like little baby Cam Newton. This is the second coming of Cam. Just keep give him a laptop. Don't don't make him ever need for a laptop, and keep him on campus. Let's see what else happened in the world of the Florida Gators. Oh, we're going to talk about it with Connor Clark. The Gators got a commitment from four-star wide receiver Isaiah Bond, um, track star. Uh, speedy wide receiver. Uh, the University of Miami practically brought out uh, the entire executive branch out on his uh, official or on, on his visit to the University of Miami. Uh, yeah. But the Gators, the Gators win one uh, over uh, Miami. The Gators get their speedster from the class. Really good get. Uh, this is a guy that that Bama wanted as a defensive back. He wants to play receiver. Uh, really fast guy, 10, 500 meter kid. I want all the track kids. Uh, Miami has his their quarterback, a guy that we also were recruiting. Um, I'm forgetting his name. Having a brain fart. Uh, is it Jacurry Brown? Jacurry Brown. Yeah, sorry. From uh, the quarter, correct. Uh, they play on the same team. They went down to visit Miami together down in Cora Gables. He hasn't even visited the swamp yet. So just a good recruiting job. Um, the name Corey Bell popped up in that recruitment. I'm hearing that he was a big reason we got this kid. Uh, really good job by the staff. Dan Mullen was on, on the beach with his toes in the sand. People ain't like that. And then, boom, we won a big one. But well, shout out to Dan and the staff, man. I like it. And this kid's going to get a yeah, big bump a big, in the rankings a... when they when they rank him properly. He's going to get a big yeah. bump. Uh, just to, to go over some stats, uh, six foot, 175 pounds from Buford, Georgia. Uh, 247 has him ranked 237 overall. Uh, their composite has them ranked 571. Um, and I know that we need to get rivals on here. So uh, the, the rivals ranking for you guys have him listed as a cornerback, which I think is interesting. Uh, they have him ranked uh, just number 83 overall in the state. So we'll make sure that you and Connor are putting a word for him uh, for uh, for bump, uh, FSU has Berg. We need you and uh, and Connor to be the uh, the Florida versions of Berg, but better. I'm surprised he didn't get his Bama bump already. Yeah, he does I hold did. an offer, like you said, from from Alabama, Miami, Texas, uh, a bunch of schools. Obviously, a smart kid got uh, offered by Air Force, got offered by Dartmouth, Duke. Uh, so uh, that uh, offer list and that hundred meter, a time lot of top end school, uh, uh, four stars. Without cutting the film, mm -hmm. I look at his 100-meter time. I look at his offers. That's four stars. Yeah, I think I think they're getting prop, they're getting back to these camps and stuff. And uh, after, you know, a weird year, that's really the camps and, and when people can – the national guys that, that handle the rankings can go and see guys in person. I think that's when you get bumps, um, you know, unless you get that Bama offer. That's an immediate – <laughs> hey, Nick well, he had the Bama offer. 
Yeah, I don't know why they yeah, sleep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe, maybe they got lost because they didn't think that Bama had a shot. So, um, so we'll, we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that with Connor later, and we'll break down the Florida Gators recruiting class. Uh, with that, we'll also talk about Jadarius Pick Perkins. Pardon me. Uh, he's a transfer from Missouri, signed just back in February. Announced his transfer at the end of April. He was the number three JUCO player uh, from last year's class. He was the number five overall player. He's a defensive back, and Florida offered him today on May 10th. Well, guys, before we bring on Tim Olson, let's get through Gator news of the week. Uh, here quickly. Uh, Nick, want to obviously get your thoughts on baseball. But before we do that, if you need a new roof or if your roof is linking or if your insurance company is making you replace your roof, especially going in, roof. especially going into hurricane season here, do you guys see there's already a tropical storm in the Pacific Ocean? It's the earliest one ever. Yeah. Um, but visit Seriously? roofs. Yeah, but visit RoofSoldier.com. Uh, they're running a special. If you mention Stadium and Gale, you're going to get $1,000 off of your roof replacement. Give them a call, 1-877-ROOFSFL, 877-766-3735. Mention Stadium and Gale, and you'll receive $1,000 off your roof replacement. Let's get through Gator news of the week. Gators baseball goes 3-1. and one beating Stetson uh, on a Wednesday, uh, Tuesday game, pardon me, uh, nine to six in a game that got a little bit heated. And then they took two of three against Missouri. The Gators are currently ranked number nine in the rankings. And that puts them uh, only as the fifth best team in the SEC in those rankings behind Arkansas, Vanderbilt, Mississippi State, and Tennessee. Nick, give us the update on baseball. Um. Good, good week for baseball. It um, Friday night, so I guess Thursday night. Sorry, um, Franco Alamon, not not great on the mound. You get a loss Friday or lost Thursday. See, I told you this. They, they start the the series on Thursday. It throws me off. Y'all um, blend this together. Huh? Yeah, uh, you just get used to Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then they start on Thursday, and you're you're out of it. So Florida drops the series opener. It, it's big for Kentucky. So. Kentucky's battling for a chance to even be in the postseason. So it's not like you're playing a, a bad team. Kentucky's not not having a good season, but they're playing for a bunch. Florida, uh, I think, is already going to be hosting a regional. That stuff comes out Wednesday. And then Friday, Tommy Mace gives you a really good start. Um, the bullpen kind of messes it up, and you're down to your last strike. Um, Corey Acting gets a pinch hit single. Kendrick Callalau, who has hit a couple big home runs, hits a three-run home run to kind of seal the game Friday. And then Florida comes out and really just handles business on, on Sunday. So two weekends in a row, uh, the Gators drop that first game of a series and, and come back to win it. Um, Florida moved up to number nine because of that. And uh, with everything going on now to host regionals um, and to host super regionals, to host a super, you got to be one of the top eight seeds. And to host a regional, you have to win the top 16. I think Florida, unless they get swept at home by Georgia and swept um, next week against Arkansas, will be one of those host teams. So um, only three regular season games left this Friday, Saturday, Sunday at Florida Ballpark. But I think you'll see some some postseason play there, um, at least for a regional. And if Florida can go, in my opinion, if Florida can go four and two over the next six, they could sneak into being – a national seed, which, which which means they would host a regional and then potentially a super regional if you win your region. So hmm. um, it's just wild because it's been such an inconsistent year and there's been so much complaining and I've been critical. Um, of you was high on well. the team in, in, in preseason, though. Yeah, well, I mean, you returned everybody except for Austin Langworthy and Brady Smith, and Brady Smith wasn't even playing. Um, but I think we got maybe got blinded a little bit because it's a team in 2019 that struggled to even make um, – a postseason and uh, had me flying out to Houston and driving the entire length <laughs> width wise of the state of Texas to get out to Lubbock. There's nothing fellas. There is nothing near Lubbock. I looked. Oh, at I've been to into, Lubbock, Nick. I looked oh, at yeah. flying into Houston. It was like flying to Houston four hours. I'm like, all right, well, are they closer to Oklahoma? Oh, it's a hell of a lot longer than four hours, Nick. That's That's about a six hour drive, my friend. I can't. I, I drove. And the way and the Dan, way you drive, Dan has touched every inch of America. Like he knows, like every crevice. So, like, you're so, well yeah, so you're, 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 Nick, if you have, if you need feedback in the future, your best flight is to go to Albuquerque and then drive uh, east. I looked at Albuquerque. 
looked at Phoenix, looked at Oklahoma City. Everything was terrible. Yeah. Just well, Phoenix is, is very far, Nick. Very getting, far. Getting to Lubbock is terrible. Can you imagine Nick booking a flight? He's like, all right, I need to fly to Gainesville. He's like, all right, Charlotte. I flew out of Orlando. <laughs> I flew out of Orlando. I didn't even try to like piecemeal my way. Uh, Nick, my you're not you're not Gaines. missing anything. There's not there's nothing in Lubbock, and it smells like cow manure. So the um, team the team should have just flown flown me out. That's what they should have done. I should have on the charter jet straight from Gainesville to Lubbock. That's what should have happened. Man, I can also, you imagine I if you drove need, there? That would no, because that would never happen. Mm. That would never. I'm not playing the Oregon Trail, Dan. We're not. We're not driving out mm. to Lubbock. Not a chance. I'll die of dysentery <laughs> before I get to, before I get to Texas. <laughs> Especially the way you drive that 15 hour drive right, turns into like a 70 hour drive. Anyway, um. <laughs> no, so because anyway. in the 20, you asked me, you asked me, we were high on this team, and like we forget that in 2019 they they didn't host a regional. They struggled in 2019, and then they start the year hot. Um, in 2020 before it gets canceled. So I think we forget that, hey, a lot of these guys that, you know, started the year off and sure, you know, I mean, you're playing Miami, but then you're playing a bunch of the other Florida teams and they're good, but they're not SEC caliber good. So um, that was a counterpoint and argument um, that a lot of people brought up is that, hey, we should have known that this Florida team is going to struggle. Look back to 2019. They weren't that good then. Um, and that's when they had guys like Will Dalton and Tyler Dyson. So it, uh, it was just interesting. I think I think they're playing hot right now, and um, they're playing confident right now, which is um, which is good for them. And uh, they just have to figure out the pitching rotation. They're going to switch it up again with Tommy Mace back on Friday. Hunter Barco slides up to throw on Saturdays, and Alaman sliding back to Sunday. He hasn't shown anything on Fridays yet, so uh, it, it'll be interesting to see what he does on Sunday now. You know what I what I think we do here is because we're talking baseball and because Tim Olson's waiting for us in the waiting room now. Let's put the Gator news of the week on hold, which I know is everybody's favorite segment. So we're gonna have a we're gonna have a nice little intermission here to talk Gators baseball with a former uh, Florida Gators legend. What do you guys say? Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, perfect. Well, let's get let's do a quick ad read so we can pay the bills real quick. As always, this portion of the show is brought to you by our friend. Carlton Black with Cardinal Financial. So if you're looking for a new mortgage, you're looking to refi, you're looking to get a jumbo loan, a construction loan, uh, adjustable rate mortgage, whatever you might need, give him a call. Rates are historically low. They're going to be going up soon. So get it while you can. 404-769-5501 is his phone number. Again, any type of loan that you may need. And if you're a real estate agent looking to partner with somebody, shout out to the person that's about to close on their new loan here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but give him a call, 404-769-5501, carlton.black at cardinalfinancial.com. Tim Olson, our friend of the show, how are you? I'm well. Thanks for having me. Tim, Tim I, was just, I was just telling them how I, I, I found you, uh, must have been three years ago, 2018, and um, we were looking up, Jonathan India was hitting hot, and I, we were trying to find out who had the record for, for uh, consecutive hits, and, and I found you, and um, you were gracious, then more gracious than I would have been if someone was coming for one of my, for one of my records, and then, uh, and then you were gone, and, and you then found me, you know, right before uh, Jacob Young, well, you know, when he was getting close to your record there again. Yeah, it, it, it lasted a long time, but um, now now it's gone. So uh, I fade into obscurity here. Um, but it was uh, it was actually a really fun fun time for him to to beat that and brought back a lot of memories. So that was cool. Tim, Tim, wanna before we get into to some of the records you had and, and your kind of illustrious Gator career, uh, you're originally from North Dakota. Did you go from North Dakota down to Gainesville? Or tell us a little bit your story about how you ended up at the University of Florida. Yeah, no, actually, um, the shirt Hutchinson Blue Dragons. I, I should have been repping Florida. Um, you caught me. That's between, okay. You caught me between playing basketball and, and baseball practice tonight. So. Uh, Anyway, um, I, I went to a junior college for two years in Hutch, Kansas, and there was a guy who was playing on the Florida team, Mark Ellis, who was from South Dakota. So there was a little bit of familiarity um, with the Gators through him in, in a roundabout way. So, um, yeah, I, I 
went on my recruiting visits to Florida and then University of Miami. I actually signed at Miami, but an academic scholarship. And then, uh, and then I caught my senses and, and switched that up and, and came to Florida. I was just telling people on, uh, on Twitter and on the message board, um, cause there's a documentary coming out about baseball scholarships. I was just trying to educate people about how private schools can kind of get around that 11.7 number. And there you go. You signed an academic scholarship. not to say you didn't earn your academic scholarship, Tim, but, uh, <laughs> just a way that, that private schools can kind of get around that number. No, it's a huge advantage. So um, Miami, Vanderbilt, some of those guys, um, they do have a, a built-in advantage there. But th the disadvantage that they have is they're expensive, right? I had mm -hmm. a half ride to Miami, and I, I got my bill in the mail. And it and this was 20 years ago, and it was still like 15000 20000 bucks. And I was like, I'm not doing <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what's, the, uh, what's the culture shock like? You get down, you're from North Dakota, and you get down to Coral Gables, and you're like, what is, what's happening here? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I won't lie. The, the Miami scene was was pretty was pretty cool coming from North Dakota. So that's just pretty it, alluring. It they, a little uh, bit. Um, but what year was this? Was that what year was this? This was two thousand. Well, 1999. Yeah, nineteen ninety nine. So um this this was at, in the the heat of the will smith welcome to miami i mean miami was the it thing right there so it, it was pretty compelling but um i just had a, a better feel for for florida and and switched it up and then when you come in as uh, as a juco guy you're you're coming in with the mindset of one and done aren't you like i, I played my one year and, and then i'm gonna be draft eligible and and just kind of have to make the most out of this year yeah. Well, I had been drafted already one time after my freshman year. Um, and then I had a, I had a big sophomore year and I went undrafted, I think because most folks thought I was going to go to go to Miami at the time. Um, and so went undrafted. So, the, yeah, that was the plan to play one year and, and, and hopefully get drafted. And that, that was the ultimate goal. I guess it worked out. Tim, talk to us a little bit about um, your time at UF. You came to you came to Florida when they were uh, a program that, you know, was was good but not really huge on the national scene. You were, um, you know, you really come in and, and you help shake things up. You you really start to bring some promise to the University of Florida. Um, what was your experience like? You know, looking back uh, during your time, obviously you, you got to set the, the hitting record and you know, your teams were pretty successful. But what was that? What was that experience like in, in Gainesville? It was awesome, <laughs> just like it is, I'm sure, still today. Um, no, I mean, it was it was incredible. We, But Florida was good. I mean, they were the number one seed in the World Series, I think, the year before, either one or two years before I got there. So, I mean, they were they were a powerhouse in the country. Um, so so I, I certainly didn't didn't do anything to. That's to, that's to my bad. It. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, no, it's fine. They, they were. They've been good for a long time. I think they had a, maybe a little dip a couple of years after I left, but um, no, they, they were solid. There was a ton of good players, and and even though we didn't get to the World Series and win a championship or anything, e even from my team um, or our team in 2000, I mean, we had a we had a lot of guys that that went to the big leagues and and had some good careers. So we had we had some dudes on that team. Tim, what do you usually do to get yourself out of a slump? Um, it's kind of nerdy baseball, but, but honestly, I, I just try to hit the ball and I tell, tell my kids all the time, hit the ball as hard as you can at the second baseman. Just, just keep hit as for a righty, you know, for a lefty, maybe it's the opposite, but just try to hit a hard ground ball or line drive at the opposite field infielder. Um, and just keep doing that over and over and over. And, and I think I was even maybe telling Nick earlier in the year when Fabian um, was struggling, you know, typically you get in a, in a slump when you're just pulling off and trying to do too much, but if you can just stay within yourself and drive the ball the other way. That That's where you, um, you're going to come back and have some success. What was your yeah, favorite stage? Right. What's your, uh, no, go ahead, Nick. You got some baseball takes? 
No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> Nick wants to go oh, into baseball here. What was your favorite? Uh, baseball, I get a little itch now. So go ahead, though. What's your favorite away stadium to play at? Um. Well, Arkansas was nice. It was brand new stadium when I played there. So that was a lot of fun. Um, but, but we didn't have a lot of rules when I played there. Our coach, Andy Lopez, pretty much just said, stay out of jail. So we had a <laughs> lot of fun at every <laughs> stadium. <laughs> this may be changed now. I don't know. Nick, don't get anybody in any trouble. Or anything, <laughs> no, but, uh, uh, it's changed a little had, bit now. A lot so so he's running a, a little bit different of a ship there. <laughs> Would have, I would sound like I would have had a great time playing for Andy Lopez. <laughs> well, he was um, he he was a little crazy. I, I love the guy, but he was he was intense to say the least. I mean, he was the most intense person I've ever met in my life. So once you got over that, um, it, it was pretty fun. But it was it was a little bit of culture shock uh, hearing some of his his post game speeches. You've heard some curse words you've never heard before. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. It, it, it would di- it would dig deep too. I mean, he, you were not going to play on that team if you were soft because you you weren't going to make it. No, there there is a thing about guys going JUCO in baseball out of high school for a certain reason, right, Nick? I think you were explaining that to me before in the past. Yeah, so if you so if you go to a Division One program, you have to you have to play for three years. Um, in baseball, you can get drafted out of high school. Um, there's there's been guys that have been considered high draft guys out of high school that have signed to Florida, um, and they've decided to just go to junior college because they they thought they were going to get drafted or get a certain number, and they didn't want to wait another three years to be drafted. And, and if you go to junior college, you can be drafted after your freshman year. And again, after your sophomore year. So um, it's not necessarily, you know, when you think of football and a guy goes Juco, you're thinking, oh, he's got grade problems. In baseball, it's just like, well, do I want to wait three years to get drafted again? Or do I think I can have, you know, uh, something might just not, you know, f- the dominoes might not fall in the right way for me. And if I can go Juco, I can just get drafted and start, you know, in, start my professional career in, in another year. Yeah. Well, and, and, um, there are no rules in JUCO, so literally it's they're like baseball farms. So you can go there and you practice every single day, all day. Um, it, whereas Division One, you know, you have all the all the time restrictions. And we played probably three times more in my junior college than we did at Florida. So um, and and you're only competing against other freshmen and sophomores, so you can get in there and, and play right away. Where you know, if you're a freshman, it's it's pretty tough to crack the lineup right away. Although Florida this year has a bunch of freshmen. Um, and I think that's why they, they struggled early. They have freshmen and sophomore. Um, but you could you could see the talent was there and they were they were gonna make a run. And I think they're gonna make a run this year. Um, Tim, going back to uh, real quick, what you talked uh, oh. you were talking about hitting your guy hitting the second base. There was the I, I know you watch a lot of the Gator games. I think Judd's turning point was that ball he hit to right center against Tennessee because for a while he um he was just pulling off of everything and looked like he was trying to hit everything 600 feet and then that ball to right center I think reminded him like hey I'm strong enough to hit the ball with some with some authority the other way I don't need to try to spin and pull everything so I think that's kind of where you saw a difference with him he's definitely cut the strikeouts down which is now a part of the game but you don't want to be striking out, you know. I think at one point he was striking out thirty eight percent of the time. He got he walked in the box. Yeah, strikeouts kill you. The strikeouts, I, I can't handle the strikeouts, especially in the big leagues right now. They're they're just horrendous. They don't help anything. But no, exactly right. I mean, once you once you start going the other way with the ball a little bit, um, things start to click. But it, sometimes it, it takes takes people longer than than others to to figure out. They can't just pull the ball. Tim, I want to ask you just about what went through your head. So you got drafted out of high school by Tampa Bay Rays, and you decide to go um, to play junior college, and then you decide um, to go, uh, you know, play at Florida. You get drafted in the uh, in the seventh round. Did you ever think that you you might go directly to the minors, um, you know, out of high school, or what was your thought process in deciding, you know, to to make the decision to, to play college ball? Yeah. So actually, um, 
I got drafted after my freshman year of college. So I didn't have. Oh, uh, my apologies. Yeah. yeah, no worries. Um, being from North Dakota, no one knew who I was. I mean, that's like, there's like 17 people there, right? Um, <laughs> so, so no one had ever heard of me. So I, I didn't have any offers. I didn't have any real interest at all. So um, other than the junior college I went to. So I went there. Um, and then after I got drafted my freshman year out of junior college, that's when things just opened up and, and I started to get a lot of attention. And Did you uh, know when you were playing North Dakota that you were potentially MLB caliber or when did it set in for you that, that Major League Baseball was a, was a potential opportunity for yourself? I remember being like in fifth grade or fourth grade and telling my friends that I'm going to be in the, the big leagues one day. And they're, you know, looking at me like I'm full of shit, you know, but uh, um, so I kind of always had that feeling like I, I, it never really went away. I think maybe my first month at junior college, um, it was a little bit like getting thrown into the fire with, with how many good players we had. Um, so that was maybe the only time I kind of was like, Whoa, this is, these guys are good. And then when I went to Florida, it was like another step, you know. Um, but the junior college I went to, was re- we had really good players too. So it, I don't feel like that step was quite as much as it was from high school to, um, to junior college. And then, and then when you get to the pros and everybody is awesome, um, then, then I started to kind of like, man, am I going to make this or not? Because uh, I had a tough time going – to my uh, A ball team from from college, m- m- going from the metal bats to wood is, is a big step up. G- give us some some stories of some minor league baseball stories. Um, you know, when I uh, graduated from college, I moved up to Iowa City for work, and we had the the Iowa Colonels up there in Cedar Rapids, and got to know some of the ball players up there, and got to hear some of their stories. But you know, what what was it like in minor leagues and you know, tell us some of your, your crazy stories or antics that happened there. <laughs> you, can you make a PG-13, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah. you know, I, I think just the, you're kind of like writing a book the whole time. I mean, it's it's wild times. You're young. You have a little bit of money. You're single. Um, you know, so it's there's definitely a component of having a good time and, and playing in the minor leagues. Um a lot of the stories that you see are real. I mean, we spend many hours on the bus and show up somewhere and just have a good time for four days and go to the next place and on and on and on. So, um, you know, I don't know that I have any necessarily specific stories, but um, it, it's, it's just a, a, a great um, a great memory. But but honestly, I, I think my year at Florida is, is maybe my best memory, though. Um, I go back to that. I mean, minor league baseball is great. I still have a lot of great friends. Um, we are like brothers, but um, th- there's just a difference in college baseball versus professional baseball. In professional baseball, everybody is, I don't want to say out for themselves, but they're, if you win or lose, it, it really doesn't matter, right? If you win two for three, two for four, and, and you keep bumping yourself up and, and make it to double A, triple A, the big leagues, that's kind of the ultimate goal where you don't really have that goal in college. The goal is just to win and, um, you know, win a championship. And that's, uh, and that's what it's all about. So that's why, uh, Nick, you was saying that I, I still watch a lot of games because I have watched maybe one MLB game this year and I've probably seen 25 of the Gators games. It's just a, it's just a different experience altogether. I love college baseball. How much, I mean, I think people forget how much time you spend. I mean, obviously, if you're, you know, busing from Oklahoma to, to Iowa, you're spending a lot of time with those guys um, in the minor leagues, but you're, you've got the same classes, you're practicing, like, these, these are the guys that you live with, you hang out with. Uh, I think people forget just, like, how much time you spend between, you know, class, locker room, practice with guys when you're in college. And, and at that age, you're really – um, forming like those kind of friendships and bonds that you'll have for the rest of your life. Absolutely. I mean, that's how even like on this show, right. My, uh, good friend to this day, Eddie Rojas, uh, introduced me to, to silk. And, um, that's, that's how, uh, 
I got on the show today, right? I mean, th these bonds last right. forever. I mean, um, you know, I still talk to a bunch of a bunch of my guys from from my Florida days. Um, uh, Nick Treffrey, Eddie Rojas. I mean, th there's a bunch. We still hang out all the time. Um, we try to get to at least one football game every year. Um, so the bonds that, that we made over that one, two years in college have, have lasted over 20 years now. So it's great. Hey, Tim, what's the um, best pitch you ever uh, faced in the, in the majors? The, you know, my the best pitcher I ever faced – well, Al Leiter sent me from the big leagues to the minor leagues. Um, he broke, I think, either two or three consecutive bats in a row, the little like dribblers back to the pitcher on cutters. And so I, I, I had a terrible time picking him up. My game was so bad that literally we got back to Arizona and, and I think I got demoted like the next day. So <laughs> I got to give him credit. His son, his son's not too bad either. Um, it Jack's appears. pretty so, good. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, no, Al Leiter was really tough. John Smoltz was good. Um, but the, the, I think the best performance I ever saw was in the minor league. Uh, Tim Lincecum pitched a triple A game against us and he had just, he had just been drafted. And I think he struck out like 17 of us in his first ever triple A game. Uh, it was, it was impressive. And, and he went on to have a, a pretty decent career too. I was going to say that left on left with Leiter is probably not, not great for you. Well, I'm a righty. Oh, okay. I thought you were yeah. lefty. My so bad. So it was even worse. I actually wish I would have been a lefty facing him. I, I that wish makes I sense because the cutter would come into you then. Yeah. Him shattering my bat in my hands. Uh, I wish I would have just struck out. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a whole different, it's a whole different story if he doesn't break those bats. He's probably a, a Hall of Famer and all. You never know, right? <laughs> Um, Silk asked you, you know, what do you do when you're in a slump? But um, baseball is so crazy because you, you you fail seven out of ten times, considered really successful as a hitter. What do you do during a streak? And you know, you you see guys like when they're throwing a no hitter, no one talks to them. Um, right. When when Jacob was going through his hitting streak, they're like, hey, do you want to talk to Jacob today? And I'm like, no, I, I don't want to talk to him at all. I don't want to ask him the wrong question and, or anything like that. What, what goes on with the team and with yourself when you're in the middle of, you know, a streak that lasts a month, two months, three months? Um, I think the key, you just don't change anything up, right? You do the same thing. Um, have, have you guys ever eaten an In-N-Out burger before? It's yeah. Kind of yeah. So, so um, I, I can hardly eat an In-N-Out burger anymore. I, I In high A, I went on a, another hitting streak and I had – I ordered like two double doubles one day and then I hit like three for four with two bombs or something. So then I had to go back the next day and seriously, like eight days of two double doubles to this <laughs> day, I can barely eat any more of those things. <laughs> so yeah, you just don't change anything up. You just keep doing what's working. That's uh, <laughs> you, your hitting streak lasts too long. It's like, hey, we need some new pants, maybe a new jersey. <laughs> uh, Tim's getting a little big, outgrowing his stuff. For real, Tim, uh, give me give me a good football memory. Um, while while at UF, um, well, probably a good. I don't know if it's good. It's probably a bad one, but I, I was there when um, Tennessee. We had the. I think we were pretty much ready to roll to the national championship. And then we, uh, um, we had to play Tennessee again because we didn't get to play him because of nine 11. And so we played him the last game of the season and they beat us. And um, that's one of the most vivid memories I had that that was heartbreaking. You guys remember that? Yeah. Thanks to. for bringing it up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry guys. That was, <laughs> a, good, that was a good one. Uh, yeah. Uh, Rex Rosen got. I know it, it's the losses that hurt the most, man. Uh, For sure. You know, it's just like uh, Dallas um, Jerry World playing playing Michigan. I mean, that that's one of the the, the worst games I've ever been at. But it's just Same. like it just sits in your you know sits in your skull like a bad smell or something. Tim, I, had, I went to the best tailgate of my entire life before that Michigan game. I was talking smack to anybody that would listen. <laughs> I got in there. The stadium's beautiful. It's filled with all a bunch of orange and blue. The Gators go up pretty early. 
going to halftime, I think with a lead, I kept my, kept my mouth running and that was the wrong <laughs> choice, my friend. Hey, that place was jumping though, wasn't it? That was an intense. That was cool. In that place. That was we good. were uh, we were we were battling a, a stage four hangover in the press box, I think, for that game. <laughs> that was a, had a, had a really nice night out in Dallas the night before, and uh, was not was not in peak performance in the press box for that game. <laughs> there were there were a lot of people who wanted the shark ga- gone after that game. That was a, that was a tough one. <laughs> yeah. Hey Tim, getting back on baseball real quick. Um, obviously, you had you know your teams had some success there at Florida. There was some success after, but but Kevin O'Sullivan seems to have had the obviously the most success as a, a Florida Gators baseball coach. What do you think is the reason why he's been so successful? So I think two two critical reasons make him um, so successful, you know. Um, and and I, I'm not there to see all the day to day admin things, so I'm sh- I'm sure he's really put together and and does a lot of good things just organizationally. But um, from the outside, I think that he does a really good job with his pitchers. So if, if you have quality star pitchers you can win. Um, so I think his ability to just coach up um, pitchers is, is critical. And then two, he can get the pitchers. He can recruit. Obviously he's doing a great job recruiting. So, um, you know, if you have dudes, you can win. Um, but he's also coaching them up um, at least from what I can see on, on the pitching side, um, you know, I'm sure he doesn't work with, with the hitters and fielders. Some, some, sometimes I, I get a little frustrated with the hitting and, and fielding. Um, but as far as pitching, I mean, he, he's, he's really one of the best and recruiting. I mean, he's doing a great job there. What was it like? I haven't, I haven't really talked to any former players, but what was it like um, watching that 2017 team win a national championship? Cause like, it's not, you're not playing, but that's still your team. It's still your school. What was it like as as a, a Gator baseball alum to, to watch them um, win, win the last game of the year? Yeah, I'm, it, well, only one team wins the last game of the year, right? So it was uh, it was great. I think that um, you know, even though it's not my team, I'm not on it. Um, you still have that same sense of pride, just like I do if I watch. Um, cheese hit that three pointer right uh, right at the end of the game or or the, the the baseball team win a championship or the football team um so you still have that sense of pride that it's it is my team um even though i'm not on it so um no it was great and it was i think it was awesome to just get that um you know that chip off their shoulder and 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 win one i think now that now that they've done that they can they can go on and and win a bunch more so um and it's just a lot of pride too and it's cool like you know now that when i tell people i went to the university of florida and played baseball um even though we were good uh like dan said even though we were good back then we weren't the florida gators of today i mean we just weren't so um so it's kind of cool to be in in that club Tim, I um, want to ask you just a little bit about, you know, college football and recruiting and, and everything else. You know, what is it that would make a, a, a guy go to, to college versus going to, you know, going to play, you know, for three years at a program like Florida versus going and, and playing JUCO? Or, or what are the things that a recruit is looking for uh, out of a coach or out of a program when they're trying to make that decision? Maybe they're a, you know, a, a third round draft pick or fourth round draft pick. Uh, to to make that that decision, what what are what goes through your head besides a just player, a relationship with the as coach? As a player, yeah. Um, to go to to go to four year versus anywhere else. Yeah, or just you know the the decision. You know, if you're a high draft pick, let's say you get drafted out of high school in the first you know five six seven rounds, and maybe you decide that you want to go you know play college versus you know major league baseball. What are what are things that you're looking for in a program? To, to help you make that that leap, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I think I'll, first and foremost, I'd start with your your money situation you grew up with has a big impact. Like Jack Leiter, for example, 
they have all the money that they could ever want. So I think he was a first rounder out of high school. I mean, he, it was much easier to turn down first round money um, when you're already rich than, than if you grew up with no money. Right. I mean, a million dollars is a lot of money to a young kid who didn't have any money growing up. So I think money is a big determination of, of, whether kids are going to sign or not sign um, high in the draft out of high school, but then going to a school. um, Yeah, I think, I think it's feel, I think it's your relationship with the coaches. Um, I think it's the, your feeling um, of the ability of the coach to get you to the next level. I mean, you got to face it. It's just like football, Nick Saban. I mean, the dude gets guys to the NFL. Florida gets a lot of guys to the NFL too, but I mean, all you had to do is look at the draft this year. Um, I think ultimately kids are going to go if, if they have aspirations to be in the, in the pros, which pretty much every kid should have aspirations to get to the pros. If you're playing at a school like Florida or Vanderbilt or um, really any of the SEC schools. So I think it's just who you feel can, can get you to the next level. Yeah, I think it also is, where you feel like you can play. I mean, if you're a shortstop and you have a kid who's a freshman in front of you, who's already starting, you might not go there. Um, so I think there's a lot of determining factors, but, but ultimately it's just feel trust of the coaches and, and who you think can get you to the next level. Yeah, well, then I, I mean, guess my next question. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, there's, no, there's, always like a, the, there's always the outlier, like a Karsten Whitson drafted ninth overall that gets to campus. So that's not normal. Um, but there's some kids who just don't think they're ready for professional level. And, and, you, and you get you get to campus, but, you know, it's it's hard to turn down. Uh, you know, if someone wants to pay you seven figures to, to be a professional baseball player, it's hard to say no to. No doubt. Uh, Tim, what what does you know? I I only played baseball a little bit as as more of a hockey player. But what makes a good baseball coach, or or what are some of the things that you're looking for out of a coach besides just his ability to get you know you to the pros? If if that's like um, a a good question, I don't know. Yeah, no, I I think it it probably depends on your position. Um, well, regardless of the pitch position, I mean. You're, you want to go somewhere where, where they can develop the talent. Um, so that's a, that's a big one. Um, I think you also want to go somewhere where you know if you're a pitcher, you, you know you're going to go there and they're not just going to burn you out and, and throw you, you know, 200 pitches a game. And so you're never going to have a chance to get to the pros. So I think there's trust. Um, and – and really it's just comfort. I mean, no coach is the same, but, um, you know, I look at the Vanderbilt coach too. Um, that guy, he has a sense of calm to him. Um, that I, I would imagine, uh, professionalism, competitiveness and calm that I would imagine attracts a lot of good players to Vanderbilt. Clearly they're good. Um, I think O'Sullivan has a lot of the same things. You, you don't really see them, um, blowing up, a lot but at the same time you know that they're fiercely competitive you, you know you can see it what i was saying that we have a lot of freshmen and sophomore on the team you can see it on o'sullivan's face sometimes that he is just burning burning hot when they make a stupid mistake that um that they probably shouldn't have but you know the, when you have a bunch of young guys mistakes are just going to come so i think uh a level of patience too is is attractive um, for a coach. That was a great answer, by the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's a big thing. I mean, Jack, um, you were talking about Jack later earlier. He was just scratched from his start last weekend. So I go back and look and he threw like 96 pitches in February against like Georgia state. And I'm just thinking, why, like, why are you throwing 96 pitches in your second start? against a team you don't need to and then i look at his, his like he threw like 200 something or almost like th- almost 400 pitches in in four starts from february to march and i'm thinking that's a lot of pitches early in the season and tim corbin does a good job like sully of protecting arms but that's a thing that if you're a dad of a high prospect hey does this coach have a reputation for taking care of arms or is he going to throw my son 140 pitches a game trying to win a national championship which 
is great if you win a national championship, but this isn't the last stop for, you know, a guy like um, a guy like Tommy Mace or a guy like Jack Lefwich that, you know, they're going to continue playing baseball after Florida. Yeah. And I think most of the coaches are pretty, I mean, they're aware of that. They, they know people are watching. I mean, um, the Jack Leiter too. I mean, he was throwing a second no hitter and they pulled him from the game. So, yeah. um, you know, the, they know they know recruits are watching and and not only that recruits are watching i mean these guys want what's best for their kids too um you know the i i coach baseball myself i mean i have two boys of my own but you know i also have 11 more boys of my own that are on my baseball team you want what's best for for your kids and um and and if you don't then you shouldn't be coaching That's good. So Tim, Tim, what are you up to these days? You're, you're obviously coaching basketball. You're coaching baseball. Are you back up in North Dakota? You're around here? Or? I was actually playing basketball. I still hoop. I try to stay in a little bit of shape. I have a funny basketball story. So Eddie Rojas and I at Florida, um, the, it was like the second day I was on campus. We were playing um, inter, not intramural. It was just like a pickup game at, at one of the Florida basketball courts. And this dude, um, big guy, he just like slams on me, um, posterizes me. And I looked at Eddie and I was like, man, um, you know, that guy thinks he's so good. If he was any good, he'd be on the basketball team. And, and about two days later, we were in the um, athletic, you know, academic center or whatever. And we walk in and, and this dude, I don't remember his name, but he literally is on a big poster like dunking on somebody. Um, <laughs> so he was good enough to be on the basketball team. And, and they almost, they almost won it. They took second my year um, to Mateen Cleves in, in Michigan state. But um, so they had a, they had a good basketball team, but um, anyway, so. Can uh, Eddie play? Or you just like, they just. What's that? Could Eddie who? Eddie. Eddie can hoop a little bit. Yeah, I'll give him some props. He can hoop a little bit. He's scrappy. He's a little lefty. You know, he's he's a point guard. He's from New York. He got to know how to hoop, right? Yeah, yeah. He's from Brooklyn, right? So he can he can get in there and uh, and and mix it up a little bit for sure. <laughs> but I'm I'm actually in Denver now. Um, uh, kind of just cliche former pro athlete. I sell insurance in Denver and. Uh, raise three kids and and living the good life, watching watching a bunch of Gator sports. Dude, I love it. Well, Tim, man, we appreciate the opportunity for you to come on um, and join uh, Stadium and Gale. I don't I don't know if we talked about it. We we may have, but um, how close do you stay? You know, obviously you're in Denver, but how close do you stay? you know, with the team, um, obviously I know you follow them, but, but how closely do you stay? You know, is it the same kind of fraternity that, that the football team has in terms of you guys come back often and uh, you guys are, are welcome the facilities or what, what's the, what's it like to be an alum of the Florida Gator baseball program? Yeah, no, like I was saying earlier, I, I still have some of my best friendships from that team. Um, I still connect with, with a lot of them. Um, we, we go to a lot of the football games um, pretty much at least one, sometimes two a year. And not just, not just my former players. I mean, I have guys that I, that I lived with, um, that were in fraternities. Um, cause I was there for two years. I, I played one year and then I came back and, and just kind of hung out, which, which probably wasn't a great idea. Um, but I did, uh, so anyway, I still have a lot of great friends, uh, who we, we hang out. Um, so it, it definitely is a fraternity, um, I don't get to come back because I live so far away to do some of the alumni stuff. I, I wish I could, and I'm, I'm pretty busy with with work and, and coaching my own kids. But um, I would imagine as I get older, I'll I'll try to get back for for some of that stuff too. But um, now I'm I, I, to this day, it was the best decision I think I've ever made coming to Florida. So um, if there's any recruits listening or anything, um, go to Florida, man. It's awesome. Dude, I love it. Well, Tim, are you, I, I know that you, you're you're not huge on social media, but is there anywhere that if somebody wants to kind of follow you or keep up with you, they can? Yeah, I'm on Twitter. Um, I don't even know my Twitter handle, but but Tim Olson, I'm I'm sure they can find me. But I am on I am on Twitter. I, I'm not on there a lot, but um, 
Um, I'm sure if someone looked hard enough, they could find me. <laughs> Dude, I love it, man. Well, thanks so much. Have a great rest of your evening. Enjoy baseball practice, and we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, thanks lot, guys. Tim. That was fun. Appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, brother. Right. Tim Olson. Man, oh, man. A good guy. I got that's that's my bad guys. You bring on a baseball guy, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna start stepping on toes. I see, I see that you don't even check the chat about whose turn it is to talk or anything else. <laughs> I'm just it's just it's the wild wild west when a baseball yeah, guy comes yeah, yeah. on. Yeah, let Dan. Yeah, yeah, let him get comfortable, Dan. It's Nick shit. I, I'm yeah. trying to back off a little yeah, bit. That's it. But that's that's my bad for for thinking that this was a, an open dialogue. You know, I stepped on. He's trying to get his baseball lingo in. I was trying to get like regular fan stuff. No, <laughs> my, my, bad. Uh, my bad. No, my bad. No, you good, bro. Uh, I'll get. I'll get. I'll get, like on, Jackson talk about the I'll get like Jackson Cole. I'll get like Jackson Cole. Baseball and shifts and everything. I'll get, I'll get a baseball player on. I'll just leave. I'll let you guys handle it. Yeah. Uh, no. We'll. I'll just. No. We'll just let you guys get a room. So can I go hang out? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. All right, boys. Before we get Spencer. All right. Before we get Spencer. On, before we get Connor on. Spencer's already hanging out over there in the corner. Uh, let's get back to Gator news of the week. Um, just run through this real quickly. Uh, women's basketball forward Jordan Merritt has been invited uh, to the Team USA trials for the uh, under-19 World Cup team. So good luck to her. Uh, this is a really cool story that I saw. Uh, Jimmy DeBose, Melvin Florney, John Williams, and Wayne Fields uh, were a group of four, four former Gators uh, that wanted to come with an, come up with an idea to uh, create an endowed scholarship in the names of Leonard George and Willie Jackson Sr., who were the first uh, African-American scholarship football players at the University of Florida. Uh, they just hit a milestone of $50,000, which is really, truly an incredible feat. Their goal is $250,000, uh, but hitting that first $50,000 is great. So, uh, so good luck and, and best of luck on the continued uh, success of that endowed scholarship um, in the names of Leonard George and Willie Jackson senior. Uh, in men's golf, Ricky Castillo is a member of the 10-man uh, United States roster uh, that's going to take on uh, Great Britain and Ireland in the 2021 Walker Cup. Uh, so uh, good luck to wild him. news, man. I'll be tripping out in this segment, man. Go ahead. Yeah, man. you're well, you're welcome. Um, the uh, Florida Gator women's golf team is traveling to Stanford, California, uh, and they're going to be competing in the 2021 uh, NCAA regional competition, which started today uh, and is going to continue through Wednesday. Uh, also, in women's golf news, uh, Macy Filler, Annabelle Fuller, and Lauren Widener were honored by the SEC. Uh, Filler was named to the all freshman team. Fuller earned a spot on the all SEC second team. And Wadener was tabbed to the SEC community service team for the third consecutive year. Women's lacrosse earned the number six uh, overall seed. Uh, they will be hosting Mercer, Jacksonville, in Vanderbilt this weekend. The winner of that will go on to their equivalent of, I guess, a super regional, which they will host as well. Uh, Gator softball swept Texas A&M and won their ninth straight SEC regular season title. They had a walk-off, I think it was a home runner's walk-off hit, uh, to win against Texas A&M uh, in the bottom of the uh, seventh inning yesterday. Um, so shout out and congratulations to women's softball. Uh, they were men the only SEC team to win every um, every weekend. They won all of their series. Only team in the league. Oh wow! It's a dandy fact to throw into your your mind. Well, perfect. Game. You know what? You know what, Nick? You can do Gator News of the Week next week. You know. Um, I'm just trying to get in where I fit in. That was a little extra fact for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah I appreciate that. Uh, speaking of which, uh, shout out to Cam who said in our chat uh, that the uh, U.S. team already won the Walker Cup. So congratulations to America. Uh, go Team USA. And Ricky Castillo won all four matches. Uh, and I was, again, uh, corrected that it was a home run, not just a walk-off hit uh, that sent the Gators uh, to the SEC uh, <laughs> winners, uh, you know, winner's uh, circle. Um, men's tennis uh, beat USF, and they're headed to the round of 16. They're going to play Illinois this weekend. They're the number one overall seed. Women's tennis season is over after they lost to the real university 
are the real USC, Southern California in the second round. And then finally, Florida uh, volleyball head coach Mary Weiss announced that Aisha Ambler uh, from uh, TCU is going to be joining their staff as an assistant coach and recruiting coordinator this upcoming season, ever losing an assistant to be head coach at the University of Virginia. And that concludes Gator News of the Week and the Nick De La Torre segment. What do you guys think about getting Connor Clark on? Yeah, let's hang out a little bit. You want to uh, shout out our friends uh, Greg Brunt and Brent Insurance? Absolutely. Shout out to the great folks at Brunt Insurance and Financial Services. Be sure to visit BruntInsurance.com for all your insurance needs. Home, auto, renter's insurance, life insurance, or any financial services, BruntInsurance.com or 954-589-2204. Big coverage, big policies. Greg, what it do? Baby. Baby. All right, so while we wait for Connor – uh, what else is what else is going on in in Gator news, Nick? Um, I know you're plugged in. Um, anything that you uh, you want to talk about on today's show? I mean, I mean, the, the Twitter, the Bird app was 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 chirping about uh, Dan Mullen's vacation. He had his toes in the sand on social media. Which which time was it? The time that he was in Cabo, or was it the time that he was at the Dick Vitale uh, thing down in um, in Sarasota this weekend? It was, the, it was the Dick Vitale thing this weekend because that was up in uh, – was it Sarasota? Yeah, at the Ritz down there. Yeah, that uh, – I think he was, he was – listen, I, I mean, that, that – well, first off, that's a great um, uh, a great cause to be on the beach for um, with Dick Vitale raising Absolutely. money um, uh, right. for cancer research. Um, but I think he was – Dan was back getting vaccinated today. He, Posted on Instagram and tweeted that he got his second vaccine today. So he was Proud to the in back Gain- He was in Gainesville, bro. The comment section under there is the wild, oh. wild west. I, I would imagine that the comment section under Dan Mullen posting his vaccination shot was like what it was being on Andy Lopez's team. Wild. <laughs> I, I haven't gone through that. I, I think I'm gonna pass. Because the vac shot's like political now, so. I'm yeah. pretty sure it was Wild Wild West under there. Yeah, but I think I think people were mad that he was tweeting from the beach, even though he was there. Um, uh, he's at in, the beach. Like, he's with. human. Like they don't think he goes <laughs> listen, to the beach. I said, I said, man, <laughs> I was like, listen, nuts, why, man. why get paid six million dollars a year if you can't enjoy some of the fruits of that labor? And uh, it, uh, Dan, and and then the it's but not what like what else do you, what else like, do you want him to do on a on a Saturday <laughs> yeah. in May, bro? It's not 1980. It's not like he has to like. Yeah, send, man, the you know, computer. A written, yeah, a he got a written message to somebody. He's got right. he's got a phone. The same phone he sent that you know his his feet his beach feet pics with. He can be texting somebody or, or you know sliding into a recruit's DMs. You, you can recruit anywhere. Yeah, that guy got stand by the the, the the Morse machine or something. <laughs> Send out Morse code. We're not. Yeah. We're not. I mean, this isn't. It's not 1940s. We're not talking about Newt Rockney recruiting for Notre Dame. Right. It's Mother's Day weekend. You have a, the Dick Vitale Gala, which I think raised. <laughs> it is Mother's Day weekend. Yeah. Can't I think. It. I think they raised like three million or five million dollars for the V Foundation for Cancer Research, which is an incredible organization. Then on Saturday, he's down at the Ritz Carlton in Sarasota. He's got his phone. I don't know. People just love – I think people just like to complain about God knows what. Yeah. Well, we landed a good commit. Uh, is Connor ready? Ready to kick it? We're, we're just waiting for him. Just waiting for him to, to join on in. Give us your thoughts be, before he hops on. get a wife, bro. Like, yeah. things don't run that smooth, man. You got to run things by people first, bro. Talk to – so you you obviously have some some thoughts. You know a, a bit about Isaiah Bond. Let's, let's break down his – um, you know, commitment a little bit more. Um, again, from Buford, uh, you know, six foot, 170 pound, 175 pound, you know, wide receiver. Um, I mean, do you th- it, it, Florida recruited him as wide receiver, not as a cornerback, right? Correct. Uh, Bama was the program um, that was recruiting him as a defensive back. Uh, Miami was recruiting him as wide receiver as well. Okay. Um, what What do you think? Uh, you know, his his spot is. 
you know, at Florida, do you, is he more of a, an X or a Y guy? Is he more of a slot guy? I think uh, Kadarius Tony's draft stock is what, or, or draft position is what kind of sold this. I think he's a slot guy. I don't think he's outside. I think Billy likes bigger guys on the outside. So I'm, I'm thinking he's more of a, a slot guy to play that maybe Kadarius Tony role. Um, speedster. So you want to get him jet sweeps, just get the ball in his hand in space. Um, he's not that sharp with running routes. Uh, he's coming in a little raw, just like Kadarius did, came in. But um, I think Billy, Billy's a profession, man. He gets these guys uh, on parts for his route running and being – being able to translate to, to the NFL. Yeah, so, I, um, I think I think the NFL, you've seen Kyle Pitts going first round. This is, this is the fuse of that label. You beat Alabama because normally if the, the off, our offense wasn't firing on all cylinders and we don't have these draft picks, that kid probably go just try to play defensive back at Bama. Um, but you see the upside of our offense with guys like Tony and, and Pitts going first round. Now we see the fruits of that label on the trail. I wanted to see it more. We should, we should win more of these battles. You got to start seeing, like you just said, the fruits of the labor of this success on the field and, right. and start winning these recruiting battles. And I think, you know, like I, I joked that, you know, Nick Saban's recruiting pitch, you know, that video that the recruit sent. I'm like, he's not it's not a recruiting pitch. He's like he opened up. He Googled Nick Saban, clicked on his Wikipedia page and just started reading accomplishments. Like that's not even a recruiting pitch. He's just reading facts. And I think. Um, that's hard to compete with when, when that's all true, but you start getting some success on the field and you got to, I mean, you got to remember, like we're talking about Tim Tebow, like the guys you're recruiting now were like, what, six years old when he was playing for Florida. Like they don't remember Tim mm -hmm. Tebow in Florida. Their, their memories of Florida are like the Will Muschamp offenses. And, and you've got to start creating some new memories and some new things with Kyle Pitts and Tony and Trask and, and, and some of these other guys to to give the recruits now that you're trying to sign, okay, I, I want to be like them. Because for, for most of these guys you're recruiting, they weren't watching Florida football when Percy Harvin was playing. They might know Percy Harvin as, you know, a Seattle Seahawk. How, how weird y'all want to get? Very weird. <laughs> um, you think Corey Bell going to be on the field soon? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, Nick, your thoughts? Um, I could see that in kind of the way that you had. Um, shoot, I'm blanking on the quarterback coach's name right now. Um, but the way that you had him brought in to be a staffer. Jules. No, not Jules. Jules is the DB coach. No, that Derek Jules McGee. Here. Derek McGee. Oh, oh, McGee. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jules, yeah. Jules is the DB coach that you're already replacing with Corey Bell. Um, Man, Garrett McGee, make it you know, weird. Ha having, having Garrett McGee there, I think that's kind of where Corey is. You know, this to me was a, a chess move for the future. And it's like, hey, we don't have an on-field spot for you right now, but we want to get you in, get you in the program. You see how things run so that if – whether it's near future or, or a couple of years down down the line, that you're ready to take over if, if a spot does open. I think Corey Bell is a dog on the recruiting trail. Uh, him being able to get this kid from Miami and Bama because Manny Diaz, he's no slots on the recruiting trail, and he actually visited Miami. So for us to land that kid like that and, and Corey Bell is getting that type of credit, and we already know how respected he is in South Florida. That ain't even his territory. So when he gets down to South Florida and sink his feet in, I think we're going to see some more fireworks from him and Brew. Um, I don't think that's a guy you're going to be able to keep on the sidelines for two years. I think somebody else is going to see his value and try to get him an on-field position. Yeah, I mean, part of me thinks that Corey Bell likely had an opportunity to go coach somewhere else, right? I mean, Corey Bell's a respected name, you know, has been, you know, coaching for for quite some time. And, you know, he was he was only pushed out because, you know, Gus Malzahn got, got hired at UCF. I um, mean, you know, his relationship, you know, with Josh Heupel, who is the, the old head coach uh, at UCF, you know, was through Randy Shannon, who didn't go with him. So, you know, it's no surprise that, you know, he wasn't retained, you know, because Randy Shannon wasn't retained. But you have to imagine that Corey Bell, you know, good, good, strong pedigree, a guy that is known for his recruiting. You know, I think that Florida really, you know, got a, got a stud there. And, you know, when he coached at, at Florida, he, you know, he was well-respected, put guys in the league. So I wouldn't be surprised if, if that's a, a really nice insurance policy that the Gators have. 
uh, you know, back there. But, um, you know, some of the things that I'm, I'm hearing um, about the DB room and, and, and coaching there that, hey, you know, maybe it'll be sooner rather than later. Not, uh, not saying that anything is imminent, but, you know, wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if that's a, uh, a move from the uh, quality control room into the, uh, to the, to the spot again. So, well, Connor's here. Hollywood Connor has joined us back again. Connor Clark rivals.com and a member of the stadium and Gale facts only podcast. Connor, and it's good to see you again. Hey, how you guys doing? Good. High energy. Ooh, today. Chilling, oh, high man. energy. Yeah. <laughs> God, you make me laugh. Uh, Connor, we were just talking about before you got Nick, on. Nick, you're muted. I can't hear you. I got I got your coffee here, buddy. I was about to say, I'm still waiting on that coffee. <laughs> are you drinking coffee for real? I, I got to stay up, man. I got I to get I gotta get gotta write some stories for tomorrow after we jump off of here. But, yeah, I, I'm uh, I'm Connor's intern at Rivals, and uh, I haven't gotten him coffee since I started, so I'm overdue. I'm like five Connor, we got five. nothing but time today, so let's just hang out. Um Let's let's talk a little bit about uh, you know the most recent commitment. Uh, we talked a, a bit about it on the show already, but but Florida does land from Buford, Georgia, wide receiver Isaiah Bond over Georgia, Miami, uh, Alabama. Break break him down a little bit. I know he's a name that you know some fans uh, knew about, but also you know the casual fan may not know much about. Uh, break down his film uh, other than just being a, a fast wide receiver and track guy. Yeah, like you said, first and foremost, fast wide receiver track guy. He got clocked at a 10 4 8 100 meter in the state semis in Georgia. I uh, think he either won states or is going to compete at states here soon and is one of the favorites. But he's a kid, smaller guy. He's probably going to play out of the slot, give you some of that elusiveness that you lose with the uh, loss of Kadarius Tony to the NFL. Uh, year behind replacing him right away, but a kid that a lot of big time schools wanted, like you said, Alabama, Georgia, Texas, Miami. And for quite a while, Miami was the odds on favorite to land him. Um, I think Silk posted on the timeline, that picture of uh, the city officials giving him the keys of the city or something like that. Cause they thought they had him locked up in the bag. Um, so uh that was kind of funny to see Florida able to flip that one just uh, 30 days after extending the offer, but a big time kid, big time dynamic playmaker that we have underrated right now. I think at rivals, I think he eventually in the most, uh, most up-to-date rankings that are be coming out soon will be a four-star prospect. And I expect him to land inside the top 250 when everything is all said and done. Connor, is he a guy? I know Florida, you said, is recruiting him or did recruit him as a wide receiver. Um, you guys have him listed as a cornerback. Self so talked a little bit about it. Uh, you know, that Alabama potentially wanted him at defensive back. Uh, do you see him staying a wide receiver? Do you think Florida tries him out on both sides of the ball? Or, or what did you hear about um, his recruitment? No, as far as Florida goes, he's specifically a wide receiver. Uh, I don't see them moving him to DB. They've got a couple good options at cornerback in the class here coming up. So I believe that he will be one of the three to four wide receivers in Florida's class for the 2022 cycle. My bad. What did I miss? I just got back, man. I used the bathroom. Oh, we man. We're talking receiver? Again? Yeah, we're talking Isaiah Bond. That's all right. It's all right. So, um, Connor, I want to talk to you a little bit about his recruitment. Um, obviously, Miami thought that they had a uh, a really good chance of, of you know landing him. They bring out the entire executive branch, and uh, they brought out police officers. It was it was one of the most wild pictures I've ever seen on a, a, a recruitment. Um, what what was it that uh, you know Florida was able to get in his ear about, and, and why do you think that that Florida was able to land him so quickly? So I think Kadarius Tony going first round had a lot to do with it. Uh, they were selling him on a similar position, and he just went number 20 in the NFL draft. So that definitely doesn't hurt. You see a kid like that getting multi-million dollar contract, nice signing bonus. It's, uh, it's a pretty easy sell. And then also uh, Corey Bell had a, a big role to play in his recruitment. He's somebody that was recruiting him, I'm pretty sure, while he was at UCF. 
Um, and then when he got to Florida, became the off-field guy, he kind of established that relationship again, but this time with the Gator logo on his chest. And then Billy Gonzalez has a great track record of developing and putting players into the league. So all in all, Florida did an excellent job selling him on that role as a wide receiver where many schools were recruiting him as a cornerback and just were able to seal the deal much earlier than a lot of people had expected. Connor, outside of Isaiah um, Bond's commitment, Florida, or I guess he announced it today that Jadarius Perkins, uh, the former uh, Missouri football player for, I guess, about two months, um, you know, has announced that he's transferring. He got an offer from Florida. Uh, do you know much about him or, or were you ever uh, following his recruitment when, when he was in junior college? I followed it a little bit only because he played at the same junior college as Dewan Black, uh, Mississippi Gulf Coast Community College. Uh, they both won the JUCO National Championship together on that team. They were both freshmen at the time. I know Florida offered him while he was a JUCO recruit and is a school that he kind of flirted with a little bit, but definitely not somebody that was a huge player in his recruitment at the time. But uh, with, like you said, him being at Missouri for only a couple of months, deciding to put his name back into the transfer portal, I guess Florida liked him enough to offer him again as a transfer prospect. So I uh, don't know a whole lot as far as where that recruitment stands right now, but it'll be interesting one to watch, especially with DeWan Black now on campus and likely to be a go-to contact if Florida is very serious about get, bringing him into the class. Hmm. Quick question. Tyler Booker, as heavy as he going to land and he'll seal the deal? What's up? That's a great question. Um, I mean, all, all things have been encouraging as far as his recruitment goes, but it's just, it's hard for me to see schools like Alabama and Georgia in the same recruitment and be confident that Florida is able to pull that one off. Yeah, Tyler Booker is an uh, offensive tackle four-star out of IMG Academy, um, elite, elite, 6'5", 325 pound guy that can move a little bit. These are guys we need, man. I want to I want to see how he if he could get a guy like that and he ain't always working with gyms, guys he got to develop. You get a guy that, all, that that's a stud with a real high ceiling and that could get good right now, you know what I'm saying? I want to see him, his hands on some guys like that. Yeah, I've published a couple different articles saying how important Tyler Booker is to the 2022 class. He's one of those prospects I think Florida cannot afford to miss on. He's an instant impact type of offensive tackle. Florida is going to be looking to bring in some new blood as far as that goes. You never know what's going to happen with Richard Garage, who should take over at left tackle. But the uh, Gene DeLance era will be over after this year. So look for somebody like Tyler Booker to come in and take a starting spot if they're able to land him. We gotta wait. We gotta wait for Booker to do it. That's what it looks like right now, Excuse man. Me. If the people behind Delance haven't been able to step up and take the spot yet, it looks like it's gonna have to be a freshman. No, I've seen people step up. Like whenever they sit Delance down, whoever comes in does better. So I've <laughs> actually seen people like step up, <laughs> like for real in real life. Uh, Connor, it's been a been a while since we talked recruiting. We're going to have a facts only uh, show here pretty soon. Uh, but since we last brought you on, the Gators have landed a number of commitments: um, Tony Livingston, Francois Knowlton, uh, Nick Evers, uh, and then C.J. Hawkins, and then obviously uh, Isaiah Bond. And they joined Savion Ellis, who committed back in in 2019, which is uh, kind of hard to believe. Um, of those prospects, which which are you most excited about? It's probably kind of a cop-out answer, but I'm excited about Nick Evers, the quarterback. He's a kid that nobody really knew his name before Garrett McGee took over as the quarterback's coach. Wasn't very highly recruited. Then Florida came in, offered him, and then he got quite a few more offers after that. A kid that once you turn on the film and all everything that I've seen over the summer at camps and seven-on-sevens and all that good stuff, he's just lighting it up. He's a, a tall, athletic kid, not going to wow you with – his ability to run the football like maybe an Anthony Richardson or an Emory Jones will, but he's got enough athletic ability to go make plays. What 
really impresses you is his development as a passer at this point in his high school career. Shows good touch on his deep ball, has good footwork. Mechanics are pretty good. And somebody that other players and other prospects seem to gravitate towards. He's done a good job of recruiting other players to come to Florida with him to this point. And it looks like he might be able to add a few more over the next month and a half or so with the, everything opening back up. He's going to be on campus recruiting a lot of kids uh, in the month of June. How big is that? that June 4th weekend going to be? I mean, it's been so long since you've been able to have kids on campus, be able to show them around. You know, I think Florida and, and all the other schools have figured out how to do virtual visits and stuff like that, and they've done a good job. But um, just how big of a, a recruiting, not, I guess not an advantage if everyone can do it, but just how big will that change recruiting, being able to have kids back on campus? Yeah, absolutely. Like you said, they've had to kind of adapt with everything shutting down with doing the virtual visits, it'll be the first time in over a year that any prospects have been able to step on campus. So obviously, you know, those kids want to get out and go visit schools and Florida's got a loaded list that first weekend, June 4th with about 10 rivals, two fifty prospects set to be on campus for official visits or unofficial visits. And it's one of those things where yes, Florida is loading up front heavy uh, that first weekend of June, but they're able to get that first recruiting pitch into everybody. Typically you try to wait longer uh, for these official visits towards the end of the year. You like to get the last word, but if you can get, be the first person in these kids ear, as soon as they open up the, the dead period, it's also a good strategy for Florida and hopefully it's able to pay off for them. Who are some names that the Gator should Gator fans should be, have their ears uh, perked up for to potentially commit or, why not? So when you look at possible commitments uh, in the near future, you have to talk about uh, Rivals 250 wide receiver Isaiah Horton. Uh, he's a six foot three wide receiver from the state of Tennessee. He's a kid that's named Florida his leader. He's going to be on campus June 1st for their barbecue that they've got going on. Uh, a kid that is a solid prospect. He's had Alabama in his recruitment. He's going to visit Miami after there. But I have to think Florida is going to try to push for a commitment on that June 1st visit date because he's already come out and stated that Florida is the top school in his recruitment. Um, another one, Jaden Gibson from Orlando, tall, lanky receiver, really great ability to go up and get the ball. He's a kid that I think you could see commit uh, before the start of the season. And then the only other person other than uh, – or sorry, on the offensive side of the ball that I can think of would be Terrence Gibbs, a running back from Winter Park, Florida at Winter Park High School, same high school that produced Gator signee Dakota Mitchell, and uh, also ga current Gators Ethan Pouncey and Jordan Pouncey. So they both, as quite a lineage of Florida players coming from that high school in Orlando, I think Terrence Gibbs could be the next in that. And then with Florida losing out on Louisiana safety, Jacoby Matthews, because we were all very surprised that he committed to LSU. Right. Um, right. Trey Donaldson is probably your next man up on that board. Uh, I know they like Kamari Wilson a lot as well, but it looks like George is the leader for that kid as well. What's a what's a good projection right now of, of where the Gators class ends up, ranking-wise? Yeah, so I've always – kind of agreed with a couple of my friends and a couple of people that I speak to about this, where you got to think with the way Dan Mullen and his staff recruit, it's never going to be at the elite level. You're always going to be somewhere between the eight to 14 range, which is not bad, but not great. Um, especially when you're competing in the sec, you'd like to be in the top five, but I think it's probably still going to be in that range between eight and 14. Where do you think uh, the Gators' you know, best unit is going to be recruiting-wise this year? Uh, what position group? I think it'll end up being probably wide receiver. Can Pictures. you actively recruit while having your toes in the sand of the beach? I'm sorry. Say that again. I could barely hear you, Nick. I said, can you actively recruit while your toes are in the sand of the beach? 
that's been a hot, oh, that's hot a issue. great question. With uh, with the development of social media, you would think you can, right? <laughs> um, uh, text messages, on. phone calls. I mean, Dan did say he called, or uh, a recruit did say Dan called him while he was sitting in the green room at the NFL draft. So if you can call somebody sitting on a couch at the draft, you think you could call somebody while your toes are in the sand, man. right? Yeah. I, I don't know. Twitter told me you had to be in the office. So I don't know. Right now, Dan Mullen is uh, debating uh, whether he should buy a tasty cake or not on his Instagram. He runs enough. He, he can afford a tasty cake. Runs a lot. Yeah, his uh, his mile split's pretty solid, too. I don't know if I could run him. Uh, what is it? He's running like half marathons at like an eight-minute mile pace or something like that. Yeah, he's running he's run a bunch of marathons. He's run the Boston Marathon a couple times. He, uh, he's, yeah, he's that's, a, that's much more running than I could ever do, so I'll give him so kudos for that. He better not run that Todd Grantham defense he had last year. Run <laughs> oh, right. Right. Speaking yeah. of running, yeah. he's not, he's not he's a running. sprinter. Let's not run that back. <laughs> Connor, I want to ask you, um, you know, th- when, when he committed, a, a lot of fans were, were definitely excited. Um, C.J. Hawkins, uh, you know, the former basketball player turned that's uh, tight saying, end. Bro. Yeah, that's the player that I think that I'm most excited about uh, uh, on this team. Uh, what, um, you know, where, where do you, how, how long do you think he is away from, from development and playing? Do you think he's a, uh, you know, play as a freshman type of guy, plays a sophomore? So I think he's a kid, depending upon his progression from year one to year two, because last year was only his first year playing football. Like you said, he's a basketball kid. If he can progress, to the level that a lot of year one to year two players do. I think he's somebody that can get in and uh, make an immediate impact. If not all the time in the red zone as a freshman, you can't teach six foot seven and the ability to jump up and go get the ball like a basketball player. So I don't know that he'll have a huge impact as a freshman, but I think he's somebody that could get playing time. And like you said, ceiling's very high because he's only played football for one year. Well, Connor, if if Nick and, and Corey don't have any other questions, we appreciate you uh, you coming on today. No, that's it for now, man. That's it, man. There's no recruiting smoke out there. Nothing, nothing really. You got some smoke for me? Maybe things yeah. will fire back up here in June. Share, and share some smoke. Up. Yeah, I was I was told that that April and May were going to be booming. So <laughs> yeah, I was told that. Then it went to June. So I'm just vibing. No. Yeah, so it. I, I put my from what I had understood, today. from what I understood, that uh, April and May were supposed to be pretty big, and then the NCAA announced that they were going to open up everything in June. So a lot of timelines, a lot of uh, commitment dates, stuff like that, got pushed back because right. kids wanted to make sure that they could get on campus and see these schools. Word up, I guess. Connor, man, thanks for hanging out with us. Yeah, man, I appreciate you guys for having me on the podcast. Yeah, you had to run it by the wife, bro. You said I didn't have a wife. No, you can't just be making plans like that. You got to <laughs> run it by the wife, bro. Yeah, man, I had to make Ooh. sure I had some time. Yeah, for sure. Connor, remind everybody where they can follow you on social media and all that stuff. Yeah, Twitter is my platform, CJ underscore Clark one. Uh, same thing as my Instagram as well, but I'm not as active on that. So appreciate you guys again for having me on the podcast. Hey Connor, I want to ask. I know, I know you go by by Hollywood and other things. Where where the name come from? Or you're not from Hollywood, so no, I am not. It just uh, came from a couple of friends that told me I started going Hollywood. And Ooh, I, baby! I don't necessarily agree with that, but I embraced it and ran with it. So it. damn, why do your name say DJ Dirty Dan? Oh, that's, that, what, that's what, your, you know <laughs> Triple D. Hey, uh, <laughs> the show goes from PG thirteen to R. So yeah, yeah. we'll talk about we'll talk about that. About names. Is, that, is, that'll be a Patreon thing. <laughs> okay, we'll do a Patreon I mean, special. Already, Connor, we appreciate it, brother. Yeah, appreciate you guys. That talk sounds like a strip club DJ name, though. DJ Dirty Dan. <laughs> yeah, it does DJ Dirty Dan? <laughs> oh. <laughs> there you go. I got that. There it is. There it is. There it is. There it is. All, always you're just ready. Stoking the flames. You're not putting them yeah. out at all. That you have that on the out, like ready. You say thirty day in. So be sure to uh, tip your weight. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, rain dancer. Um, the uh, 
where I got that app from, you guys don't care, but I'm going to tell you a couple weeks ago, I went to a, a Tampa Raptors game when they were playing the Brooklyn Nets and they're really trying hard to make, you know, Tampa, you know, Toronto's home for, for basketball season this year. And that's what they do after every time they make a three pointer, but there's not like a lot of energy, like in the crowd. I mean, first off, there's only, I think 3,200, 3,900 people there. And a lot of them are fans of other teams, whatever, you know, Tampa's trying hard to, to support the NBA team, but that's the only thing that they do. Um, I don't even remember any of the basketball players on the Raptors, but they'll be like Corey Knowles for three. And then they'll go. <laughs> so, so, so I wanted to do that in my, in my everyday life. Yeah. Okay. Every time I do something successful. So that's the first time I've used the app. So thank you. Outstanding, Daniel. <laughs> well, was, I appreciate it. Hey, thanks. Yep. That was quite an adventure you took us on there, bro. That was quite an adventure. I didn't know where you was taking us on that trip. Was, <laughs> but you can't get that time back. Yeah, I did not I did not get that time back. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. Connor, we'll talk to you soon, brother. All right, man. Appreciate you guys. All right. Uh, speaking of not, uh, of time, things that you can't get back, what you can get back is your ball hair. So, so talk to us about manscaped.com and take us out. Oh, shout out to the great folks at manscaped.com. They sent your boy the lawnmower 4.0, damn. Woo! Hey, man. I crunk it up. I threw it on the charger. Yeah, man, I threw it on the charger, right? And I threw it on the charger. I seen something light up in the front. I said, oh, shit. I think they, they made some, some adjustments. But I didn't crank it up. I had, like, I had to get that full charge. So yesterday... I took it for a ride, man. I crank it on. It has an LED light. LED light. I cut the lights off in the shower. I said, like, you know what? Like that's a, that's a wild thing <laughs> to do. That's a that's a wild experiment. No, because I, I shower with the light off anyway. I like to oh. set a vibe. Yeah, the music's going. It's a whole vibe when I'm in the shower. I said the music. You know what I'm saying? Usually I have the lights off, but if I got to trim, because you could trim in the shower with the lawnmower 4.0. Of course. So I'm in the shower and I'm just like, mm, now the 3.0, I couldn't cut the lights off. The 4.0, cut the lights off, trim it. Don't worry about skimming nothing, cutting nothing. Your balls are safe, even in the dark. Long more 4.0 and the great folks at manscaped.com. Be sure to use coupon code SG at checkout. Keep your balls safe. Groom them. A little, a little LED spotlight there for you. You see it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Huh. It's, hard, it's hard to miss, man. My barber don't have that type of precision on his clippers. <laughs> I still haven't broken out the 4.0 yet. I'm still on the 3.0. It did get the ball deodorant. Use that. I mean, upgrade your light, um, bro. But uh, yeah, now I know that there's a light on it. Um, you take a shower with the lights off. Oh, that's, a, that's, that's a whole mood. Hey, you know, I'm not picturing it or anything, but that's, a, that's an adventure, you know? That's a vibe. I can see it. I'm that guy. You see the, the meme of the guy that carrying a whole surround sound in the bathroom every time I take a shower? That's me. Okay. My, my wife hates my guts when it's time, like shower time. <laughs> and all my kids, both of my kids have that same trait. So they, they carry whole uh, laptops and, and music boxes and everything to the bathroom. It's a whole vibe. Is yeah, it a I certain just, type of music or does it depend on the vibe you're trying to set? Uh, if I'm showering to go to a brunch, day party, I may have some, you know, uh, Drake-ish celebratory music going. If it's the evening, I may have some Sade going. It just depends. This is a vibe. Very good. I'm music therapeutic, man. Music, Put some music, music on the shower. It's therapeutic, Dan. Try it out. If I'm watching a Netflix show, bring the laptop in. Just like keep the Netflix show going. Got a shower. Right. Right. Why not? Hmm. What are you doing, shower, I, Dan? Just twiddle your thumbs. Apparently, just, meditate. Just <laughs> no, <laughs> so I, I've never been a long shower person. I'm usually in and out of the shower in like two minutes. So, um, you just get in the water. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I guess I've just never been the type of person that took like long showers or baths or anything. So, like, I've got, I mean, I got friends of mine that'll be in there for like 30 or 40 minutes. I'm like, what are you doing? I mean, I don't want to know everything about right. in there, but, um, but I guess it makes sense. You know, I just, I've never used the shower as a place to vibe. So, so maybe that's, uh, that's my culture project for the week. Get you some candles, man. Like just some incense, you know. Like some incense. All right. I'll, I'll report back next week. I'll take a long shower and report back to you guys. You got to report back, bro. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, if there's a report back, you can leave details out. Just <laughs> right, out. right, right. A thumbs up or thumbs down. That's that's the report. Come back, Silk. I really got to know myself. <laughs> nah, bro, I don't want to know that. <laughs> oh man. Hey, who's got the song of the week? Is it is it Nick? Is it me? I think it's up on me. I was bouncing back and forth um, between going the country route, Dan. Okay. Um, who who were you thinking? My guy Colby Cooper. Okay. Who, uh, I thought you were about to say Lil Nas X. I met him out in uh, College Station. He's a Texas boy. He's like yep. six foot eight, three hundred something pounds, and uh, was riding he his music. He's, he's got he's some. A, he's got some good music. It ain't me. I think is the the one that I know. Yeah, that's, that's one. Yep. That's one of them. Um, so I'm gonna go this with him. Like this is like a fan favorite. Cam's in here coming on it too. This is fan favorite. This your boy. I, I, I know. I think just, Cam's just, just giving a uh, show title. Oh um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. But I'm going to go with a, a Florida – I, mean, I, I was going to go with this DJ who I found, but who knows. Um, but I'm going to go with a Florida reference to Tom Petty from my boy Colby Cooper. The song is called um, Tom Petty. Oh, creative. <laughs> yeah. The song is called Tom Petty. At least you know what the song's about. You know, it's it's right, never right, throws right. you for a loop, you know? <laughs> it's right up, right up in front. That's good. I like it when they let it, they they lay it all out there for you. So be the first time I hear heard this song, and probably the last time. No, no, pretty sure I hear it again. It's some type of shindig. Same corner, same time. Same corner, same time. See boys next week. Already, he's already stealing my stuff. Gee, Williker. <laughs> <laughs> all right, boys. We'll out. see you next week. <laughs> well, now you got G Willikers, Dan. Yeah, let's that. That's all you. G Willikers is all mine. Gosh, golly. Yeah, by golly, G Wiz. All right, boys. Wet spook only needs one rebound. So I, fi- I figured show. out why Nick was so quiet when Connor was interviewing. He was posting up, you know, literally a, a five paragraph essay over on, on Gators territory about oh, that baseball was facts. <laughs> <laughs> the baseball stats are copy and pasted from the. Uh... Oh, okay. <laughs> From the notes, and I've been sitting up there. I got too many. I got. I had to write this story. Um, and I'm, I'm, I had to use the bathroom. My son wanted French toast sticks. I uh, know you came <laughs> back. I'm we like a single talked. dad right now, man. So I'm like scrambling. <laughs> Where's your wife at? Where's Garrett? No, see, my wife's annoyed that because we're getting our bathroom redone. So uh, we have one right. bathroom right now, and she just don't have time for that shit. So she's staying at her mom's <laughs> to the bathroom <laughs> done on Wednesday because she ain't got time what? for this shit. Yeah. Okay. The kids were staying there too, but then they got they they got sick of that shit. They, they got to come back to that. It's cool over here, you know what I'm saying? It's the vibes over here. Yeah, they're like fuck that. Yeah, cause you cause you go cook them French toast and not say shit about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like just cause they ain't getting no real dinner. They get some French toast sticks and shit. Yeah, a little nine p.m. French toast sticks. Yeah. Mom's not here. Yeah. Fuck it. Hey, tell Harlem he better juke that next way out his shoes though. Yeah, they hauled ass. <laughs> Yeah, he's juking too much. You got to fucking sit. The pop on to fucking throw the ball more, bro. I don't want to play quarterback. I don't like that shit. It's too much pressure. How Everybody, much are they throwing all, the all the other moms at? and shit be mad at you. What's up? How much are they throwing the ball at that age? Like, I mean, some of these teams that have, have been like, hold on. Do we want some of these teams that have been together, like, actually in practice, they connect a lot. They oh, yeah. deep we, passes we can end the camp. Okay, but, um, sure. Some of the teams that have been together, you could tell been gelling and together for a while. They they actually throw, throw, throw the ball quite a bit. bit. Yeah. yeah. What's the what's the rushing rule? Because like you're you're saying like they just they just come in and it just takes off. Do you have to like count down? They can't just like nah. run, run and meet in the end. I mean they I mean they're back at like a certain amount of yards. And as you get close to the first down mark, it, it shortens or whatever. But um, nah, it's just a straight rush in. No blocking, no nothing. So it's like quick passes, double passes. Like that type of shit, or you just got a haul ass, like a lot of like fake jack sweeps, a lot of ball movement. But I, I, just, I, I love like, it, man, because it's just like all skills, man. Even like when they practice and stuff, like like competitive, they don't need to be tackling and shit like that. So yeah, I, I, I like what he's doing right now. He's ready for action and shit, though. When does I'm sorry, when you, are you gonna put him in tackle or no? No, nah, no. Nah, yeah, is he playing funny. baseball? Nah, he don't want to play. I'm just letting him play whatever he want to play, bro. I feel you, I feel you there. Until he asked to play football, I wasn't even going to let him play. I just let him play whatever he want to play. Well, you need to tell him we got Nick on the podcast now. He might want to play baseball. 
Uh, no, he's told, a, told, he was I fucking raw Corey. in baseball. He just didn't like it. it was, he just doesn't like it. It's not so I, I can't I make a play. Corey, My maybe. dad's about to cry. I told Corey <laughs> when he was young, I was like, dude, you need to strap his right arm to his body and only yep, put stuff his in his left. Yep. Only put stuff he's in his left. He's getting the hang of – at first he couldn't get the hang of like throwing it. Now he's getting the hang of throwing that football, man. Like he, it, it, like his form and everything is getting nice. One thing about it, he's a junkie, so – if he, he like gets his mind, he, bro, I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> Going in the middle of the night, this man is just watching a kid, Patty Mahomes, just work on throws and shit. Like, bro, close that shit and go to bed. Yeah, Patty Mahomes is an animal. He's a uh, freak. But these kids have got so much access to shit. Like, like my son does shit on the basketball court, Euro steps and all type of yeah, moves. I mean, you bro. can literally pull it up. I'm not step teaching step that shit, dog. Right like, how in the fuck did he learn this shit? <laughs> <laughs> he said he'll put a YouTube video on repeat all day, and like, and they got that the move broken down yep. on YouTube, bro. It's like crazy. I mean, that's how I used to when I used to take tennis lessons. That's what they would do. They would record us and be like, "See right here, that's what you're doing wrong." And you would literally go out there and right after you watched it, and they would show bro, you. It's some nerves that are breaking down like all these guys' moves. Like they got time on YouTube, Harding that step back shit. Like each step on how he does it, and these kids just mimic that shit. What's the number, Dan? Five hundred hours per. Hey, minute? I gotta go. I'm gonna be a dad. Yeah, yeah, I got you, bro. Um, right. yeah, five hundred hours per minute. I think. Is what's uploaded. That's wild. It's crazy. We're about to add two more hours to it. So, all right. Yeah, so, I'm, we, uh, what are we calling this? Get stop. to know myself. Get to know myself, or what was the other one? There. Get to know myself. Dude, I need to know what happened with Neil Cool um, or whatever the FSU thing. Okay. So, somebody lied and said their wife had cancer and got a fake GoFundMe and scammed them for thousands upon thousands and dipped out. Bro, I, I, need, I, need to, I, I need that tweet. Or they need that. Oh, or uh, famous at rest stops. So famous at rest stops. <laughs> oh. I think famous at rest stops. Famous rest stops is better. Good. That was funny. Rest stop famous <laughs> or famous. The rest of rest, rest stop. Rest stop famous. But it's rest at the very beginning when Silk said he used to. Oh, uh, um, see, I don't like put it at the very beginning. That's all right. That's still. What if it's a better one? I don't really care either. Yeah, rest stop famous. That's yeah, fun. I do remember that because I was about to tweet the Chevy Chase peeling off the interstate on the rest stop exit. Bro, Silk's wild. He said he stops to get noticed at rest. Stops. That, <laughs> that's an amount was, of time that I wish I had, you know? He was lying just like he was lying about turning the lights off in the shower, bro. Bro, I, I, I don't he know what doing is. that. He's a character, man. I love how he does it for the show. Bro, I can't. You I, know he I, ain't doing this. No, bro. I can't take long showers. I don't know how people do it. What? Just like people that poop for like 20 minutes and just like sit there. Like oh, I can't do that, but... You got, that that like you got that toilet. like a therapy session for me, bro. You seen that toilet designed like this to like restrict blood flow, so employees don't sit on the toilet at work. You ever seen that? No. Someone designed that shit. Some architect. What did you do? I'm sorry. It's it's a toilet that has like a slight Probably slant the guy on that it. Owned the toilet making factory. It's like a slight slant on the toilet, so like if you sit on it for longer than like 10 or 15 minutes, it like restricts blood flow, so like you just like can't comfortably sit there anymore. To stop employees from like yeah, sitting on the toilet at work. Sit level, so it makes it feel like you're sliding off of it. So you have to make yourself sit on it. Yeah. <laughs> so you get tired of it. But I bet it was the guy that owned the toilet factory, like the place that made all of them. He was like, no, nah, fuck this. All these people were sitting on the toilet all the time. Watch this. Boom. Mm. Uh, Spence, you're going to put this up on YouTube? Yeah, I got it. Cool. Right, Which part was Corey talking about? Edit that out. I mean, I know I have, I have it uh, marked. But, uh, it was during Connor when. He yeah, came when he was like, I came from the bathroom. I oh, honestly okay. just like don't follow recruiting at all. Yeah, no, Corey you're and Connor handle it. So he came on. You're, he's like talking about kids. I, mean, I don't know who the hell that is. I don't either. And, I'm just trying to keep it going. And he's.